Hey guys, welcome to part 2 of what if Naruto was adopted by Aruka. If you enjoy the video then like, share and subscribe and also comment your thoughts as it inspires me to make more such videos and remember to check out my playlist section for other interesting stories. So let's get started. Chapter 6. Demons of the Mist. Is this the third or fourth time this week? Naruto asked rhetorically, pulling a thorn out of his coat wearily. Fifth. Sasuke supplied with an equal amount of enthusiasm, hoisting the small cat up to peer at it boredly. He held it by the scruff of its neck, disallowing any struggle from the annoyed creature. First two were cats, then a dog, then a cat, now this one. Terra, the name was. Sasuke, you might hurt her, came Hanada's small, fretting voice. As usual, she had spotted the runaway using her Byakugan and the other two had closed in from opposite sides. All in all the team was getting pretty good at catching stray pets, although it was beginning to wear on them. Sasuke huffed and tossed Terra to her, the cat flailing a bit but landing upright on her shoulder and hissing at the boy. I'm getting tired of these errands. That's what they are. Not even worth being called missions. Naruto turned his head to the side at his friend's words, shrugging noncommittally but of more or less the same mind. Even Hinata's couldn't argue with him although she was more willing than either of them to perform such mundane tasks for as long as possible. Sooner or later they would have to engage in dangerous missions where they might be hurt, or worse. Her imagination was just about to get the better of her when the telltale cloud of smoke signaled Kakashi's arrival. Yo, he said placidly, I traveling between the three in a way that suggested he might have overheard their little conversation. Well done you three. That brings our number of missions complete to 26. If we hurry back, the Hokage might have another to give us, the day is yet young. Three resigned nods met him, and he frowned slightly beneath the mask. Across town the four stood in front of a long desk, occupied by numerous tomes and scrolls, attended to by the Sandame, Uruka, and a number of other ninja, presumably of Chunin rank. Uruka looked over Kakashi's report nodding to himself as village leader shuffled scrolls around. As always, he consulted the D-rank list that most genin teams handled. He blinked, though, and looked up at a restless-looking Naruto and a particularly surly Sasuke, even Hinata looked more uncomfortable than usual. Something wrong, he asked calmly, although the answer to his question could be seen a mile away. Hokage-sama, Naruto began carefully, shifting his weight subconsciously and glancing at Uruka a bit guiltily. D-rank missions are important, I know, but is there something else we might be able to do? The Sandame looked to Kakashi for a moment, though the silver-haired man looked disinterested, and even innocent. No disrespect meant, Sasuke continued, though he didn't seem very reverent, but D-rank missions are designed to build our teamwork while getting small tasks done in the process, correct? A small smile had appeared on the old man's lips, and he nodded. I think Kakashi can vouch for our teamwork, and Genin are allowed to do C-rank missions as well. Are you saying that you're ready for a C-rank mission? The question was offered mildly, but it carried with it an unspoken weight that they all understood. C-rank missions weren't necessarily high on the threat scale, but they did carry some possibility of danger. His calm, calculating eyes fell on Kakashi who shrugged before responding for them. They did pass my test with flying colors, Hokage-sama. They have also completed a remarkable number of D-rank missions in only two weeks' time. I don't think a C-rank assignment should be out of the question. I agree, came the congenial response, as if this had been planned from the beginning. I have been looking for the right team to assign this mission anyway. It is a C-rank escort mission, a bridge builder from the wave country desires protection. Here is the briefing. Kakashi stepped forward to accept the small scroll, bowing slightly as he did. Nearby Uruka tried to seem busy, but he was absolutely glowing. You will leave in the morning for the wave country. Make sure you are all prepared for a long mission, and get plenty of rest. It was difficult for Naruto to keep in his excitement as they bowed and departed, and even Sasuke's smirk seemed more pleased than usual. Hanada's brow was knitted in worry as she walked a pace behind her friends, though aside from the concern she did not appear reluctant. If anything, the girl showed some resolve. Outside Kakashi unraveled the scroll and went over the details of the mission. All three listened intently until he was finished. 
All right you three, you heard the Hokage. Get your supplies together. Everything from ninja tools to several days rations. Meet at the front gates at 7 a.m. sharp. Understood. They all nodded again, and he concluded the orders as they exited the building. Good. Dismissed. Sasuke bid his allies farewell as he moved off to his apartment to prepare, leaving Naruto and Hinata to walk down the street towards Aruka's home. They were silent for a time, the blonde boy's exuberance fading slowly as he began to notice his friend's apprehension. It would be erroneous to think that he was in tune with her enough to tell how she was feeling, but living in close quarters for a while, with some pointers from Aruka, had allowed him to catch on to hints quicker. What's wrong, Hanada? he asked, keeping his voice casual and chipper. To his surprise, her cheeks didn't flush, no fidgeting occurred, and she didn't start stammering. Instead Hanada was biting lightly at her lower lip, silent as they walked towards their lengthening shadows. A sidelong glance revealed only that she was nervous, reluctant to speak, as if for fear that words might break something fragile, or open a door through which frightening prospects lay. Naruto-kun, Hanada began cautiously, index fingers moving to press together. Are you, are you sure about this mission? She appeared to wince very slightly, as if it had been painful to get the words out. It was difficult enough for the girl to express herself, and more than just questioning her friends she was afraid to discourage Naruto especially. The blonde boy thought about it for a long moment. Aruka had chided him about impulsive answers for years, encouraging him to think carefully in conversation, especially when it involved those close to him. Hanada looked like she was being careful with her words, so he had to do the same. Naruto scrunched up his features slightly, an action that normally elicited a blush from Hanada, for whatever reason. He laced his fingers behind his head as they walked, considering for a full minute before offering a response. I don't think Kakashi-sensei would vouch for us unless he really thought we were ready. You, me, and Sasuke have been training together for years, so it makes sense I guess. The Hokage and Kakashi trust us enough to do a C-rank mission, and I trust you and Sasuke. I'm as sure as I can be, he finished a bit lamely, casting somewhat of an apologetic grin at his friend. What about you, Hanada-chan? He continued, keeping in mind more of Aruka's advice about considering other people's thoughts and feelings. I, Hanada began, still chewing absently at her lower lip. I trust you and Sasuke too. I'm just. She seemed to have trouble with the words, struggling for a moment before it all came out in a rush. I I'm afraid that one of you will get hurt, or of something going wrong. I'm scared that I'll hold you back or get in the way maybe even put the team in danger or cause somebody to be harmed, or worse. You and Sasuke are always strong and confident. I don't want to hold anyone back, and I don't want anybody put in danger because of me. She trailed off at that, her cheeks flushed now in shame, eyes on the ground. Tears had sprung unbidden to the corners of her eyes, though they stubbornly refused to fall. Her fingers were white as they pressed together subconsciously. It was a long, painful moment before Naruto responded. After we became genin, Uruka-sensei told me that we'd be going on missions together, Naruto started as they rounded a corner, bringing their shared apartment into view. He said that eventually we'd be sent on dangerous missions, and that it was. Dot dot. Possible that we could die on them. Hanada didn't look up, but seemed like she wanted to voice some kind of protest in response. He continued before she could voice full of assurance and cheer. I know that, but I trust you and Sasuke. I know you'll do your best to keep us safe and accomplish the mission, and we'll do the same. On impulse he reached over and caught her pinky finger with his, winking and giving it a little squeeze. You're never going to hold us back, Hanada-chan, I promise. Have a little more faith in yourself. I know Sasuke and I have plenty of confidence in you too. He gave another of his patented smiles and lowered his hand though it proved to still be attached to Hanada's. The girl, while as red as she possibly could be, was holding on tight. They walked onward in silence for a moment, and Naruto felt some heat rising to his cheeks as he realized they were sort of hand in hand. Well, finger in finger, anyway. But some tension seemed to release from Hanada's shoulders as they continued, and she only had to wipe a single threatening tear away. She nodded slowly but firmly after a time, her face still approximately the same color as a ripe tomato. Thank you, Naruto-kun, 
she said finally, so quiet he nearly missed it. The blonde boy scratched at the back of his head awkwardly, but managed a broad grin despite himself. Before he could think of a response, however, Aruka came around the corner a few meters behind them. Oh hey Naruto, Hanada, I wanted to help you two pack for. Aruka's voice broke off as he focused on them, blinking at the pair from several paces back. They both spun at the same time, hands snapping back as if shocked by a sudden surge of electricity. The slowly spreading smirk on their old teacher's face proved that they had been too slow, however. This will be your first long mission, so I wanted to make sure you two have everything you need, he continued nonchalantly, as if he had seen nothing. Naruto's sheepish grin did little to hide the color in his features, nearly matching Hinata's brilliant hue. They both nodded vigorously and fell in next to Aruka, glancing at one another furtively as the Chunin continued on about the various tools and supplies they should consider taking. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Ready to set out, Kakashi addressed his team in front of Konoha's gate a few minutes after the agreed upon time. To all three Genin's surprise, their instructor had showed up early, almost the same time they had. After quickly checking their equipment and explaining the mission, they now stood waiting for their client to arrive. Now remember, danger isn't very likely on this mission even if it is C rank, but it is possible. It'll take us two days to get to wave country at a pace Tazuna can keep, so keep alert. We'll rotate positions frequently, but for the start Hanada will take point. Naruto and Sasuke stay on either side of Tazuna, and I'll bring up the rear. Each of them nodded once in affirmation, just as an old man wearing a sandogasa approached. He also appeared to be drunk. Didn't I hire ninjas to escort me? The bespectacled old man hiccuped roughly, taking another long swig from a brown bottle that smelled strongly of alcohol. Thess are a bunch o' kids. He stopped to look them over, a dubious expression plastered on his face. This is Team 7, Tazuna-san. I assure you they are all qualified ninja. This is Naruto, Hanada, and Sasuke. Team, this is our client, Tazuna, a bridge builder from the Wave Country. All three nodded politely, though with varied expressions. Naruto seemed annoyed. Sasuke appeared as apathetic as usual, though with a touch of disdain in his eyes. Hanada was despondent, averting her gaze and looking at the ground. Naruto nudged her lightly flashing a brief smile that she returned feebly. Ah whatever. Just don't cause me any trouble, kids. Tazuna chortled to himself and took another drink, turning without further conversation to start trundling down the road out of the town. Kakashi followed immediately, cocking his head towards the man to indicate that it was time to leave. After a shared doubtful look, Team 7 assumed their positions and began their mission. At Kakashi's request, Hanada activated her Byakugan every kilometer or so, scanning far ahead just in case. Her allies stayed alert at their stations, eyes scanning the trees on either side calmly. More than one person had already assured them that there was little chance of obstruction, let alone from anything more dangerous than a bandit. Kakashi seemed bored as always, his one visible eye half litted as he plodded forward behind the troop. Scenery came and went as they passed through glades, over rivers, and intersected other roads. Around midday, after a brief break, they had shuffled positions and Naruto now set the pace out front, keeping closer watch than he had previously. Sasuke walked on Tazuna's left, Hinata matching his steps on the opposite side. Only Kakashi glanced aside as they passed a stray puddle, his expression unchanged though causing Sasuke to take note of it as well. It seemed odd to the Uchiha that a puddle would be in the middle of the road on a sunny afternoon, especially when it hadn't rained in a while. But their instructor seemed uninterested, so he turned his attention back to the forest. Seconds later there was a violent metallic clinking, accompanied by an intense killer intent. All three genin pivoted simultaneously, each with a kanai in hand as if it had appeared there of its own will. But they were too slow. Kakashi's eye was wide in surprise as barbed chains pulled tight about him, their lengths attached to two cloaked ninja that had apparently come out of thin air. The barbs of the chains dug in viciously as the pair of assassins chanted together. First one, they snarled. Faster than any of them could blink, the lengths of metal retracted to their wielders. The result was lost in a cloud of mayhem and gore, 
what was left of Kakashi falling to the ground and kicking up a haze of dust and dirt as the chains ripped cleanly through the Junin. Four pairs of eyes were wide in shock. It had happened so fast. Tazuna looked like he might be sick. Sasuke cursed and grit his teeth, preparing for a fight. Hanada's horrified gasp was replaced quickly with rapid footsteps, placing her between the two ninja and the bridge builder. Fear threatened to take hold of her, but she forced it away. As quickly as the attackers had appeared, they blurred in movement, seeming to vanish from sight. Second one. The echo came immediately behind Naruto, who had been caught outside of the group at his position on point. Even as he turned he knew it wouldn't be fast enough. Each of the assassins raised a clawed hand, now a mere meter away, the vicious links attaching them already threatening to encircle him. Naruto grit his teeth, still mid-spin, forcing himself down towards the ground in an attempt to flatten and avoid the weapons. Thankfully, his teammates had recovered. A shuriken ripped through the air, catching the chain in its flight and pinning it to a nearby tree. Sasuke had leapt towards Naruto the moment the attackers had vanished, sensing the weak point and reacting precisely. A kunai followed hot on the shuriken's tail, striking the tree trunk through the center of the first weapon and securing the chain tight to the tree. The Uchiha landed a breath later, striking out at both attackers with vicious kicks and knocking them both off balance towards Naruto, who didn't miss a beat. The blonde boy turned his fall into a sidelong roll towards one of the attackers, catching him off guard with a flurry of blows and slashes from the kunai. But his opponent was good. It was apparent that the enemy was at least of Chunin level, and the vicious-looking claws they wore indicated that they were close-quarters combat specialists. After surprising the man with a few solid blows and some minor slashes, he caught up and began trading blows evenly. Naruto, like his companions, may have been fairly ahead of their years in taijutsu, but the assassin likely had years of experience in his trade. Blood sprayed from the back of Naruto's hand as a claw raked it, forcing him to drop the kunai and leap back. An odd tingling sensation rose immediately from the wounded hand, eliciting a curse from the genin. Poison. Naruto called to his allies before reengaging his foe. His only real hope was to survive and keep the assassin from getting to the others, praying that Sasuke and Hinata could handle the other and come to assist after. As soon as Sasuke had pinned their weapons, the other attacker split off, rushing to Zuna with claws bared. Hinata stood ready in her Jukan stance, bloodline activated and her features set in determination. Sasuke blurred next to the oncoming foe, sweeping a leg in an attempt to trip him up. The enemy ninja leapt, though the kick caught his right leg, throwing the jump off course. Hanada was ready. Eight divination signs. Sixty-four palms. She cried, eyes narrowing in concentration. Thanks to Sasuke's actions her attacker had slowed and been forced to jump too high, just within reach of the young Hayuga. Two strikes, she murmured, hands flying as she shifted forward to intercept the oncoming ninja. Her first two blows sparked tiny blue flames on his chest and stopped him cold, but she didn't let up to make sure her aim was on. Four strikes, she continued methodically, limbs moving faster with each new set. Eight strikes, sixteen strikes, Hanada ground her teeth, the muscles in her arms screaming in protest as her speed reached its peak, the power in each blow increasing exponentially. Thirty-two strikes, her attacker coughed and staggered back, a small amount of blood spattering through his black cloth mask. Halfway through her series Hanada faltered, stumbling back and breathing heavily. Her arms shook violently, the strain of less than half of the ability apparent in her whole body. The assassin growled, dropping to one knee and breathing even more heavily than the girl. He reached into his belt pouch, withdrawing two small spheres, preparing to cast them at the ground to throw up a smoke screen. But he never got the chance. Kakashi was suddenly just there, holding Naruto's attacker limp in one arm and his accomplice's neck in the other. He looked calm as ever, though there was an undertone of anger in his eyes that was felt more than it was seen. Well done, you three, he stated dryly, a bit of pride showing through his curtness. Hanada collapsed onto her knees, still shaking but overjoyed and relieved to see their teacher unharmed. Sasuke rose from his crouch trying to seem aloof but succeeding only to a degree. He, like his friend, was thankful as well. Naruto, are you all right? 
It was these words that drew their attention to the blonde boy, laying scrawled on his back where he had been engaged in combat. Hanada gasped and tried to stand too quickly, falling back but managing to call to her friend. I'm fine, Naruto sighed, sitting up slowly and holding his head with his uninjured hand. I just moved too much after I got hit, had to cut out the poison. It was then that they noted a sizable gouge taken out of the back of his hand and the bloody kanai sitting next to him. As soon as Kakashi had intervened he had sliced open his own hand, allowing it to bleed freely for a time to get the poison out. The wound, however, already appeared to be closing on its own, skin rapidly stitching itself together under the cover of blood. He stood slowly, wobbling only slightly as he made his way to the rest. Aside from appearing to be a bit pale, Naruto seemed as well as he claimed. Quick thinking, though you should sit down for a while. Doubtless some of the poison circulated through you during the conflict, and I didn't bring any antidotes along. Sasuke, excellent reaction time, you saved Naruto's life. Hanada, you acted properly protecting Tazuna, and what's more you incapacitated a skilled enemy impressively. Naruto, you were right to engage your target to keep him away from the others. All in all, excellent work. Now, he continued, turning his hard stare towards the bridge builder. I think we need to have a talk. It took a few minutes for Kakashi to get the assassins tied up and awake, allowing time for Hanada and Naruto to recover. Sasuke bandaged his friend's wounded hand while they spoke. Thanks for the help, Sasuke, Naruto said with a sigh, wincing once as the cloth tightened around his hand. The Uchiha shook his head, smirking slightly. I only distracted them long enough for you two to take them out. I dunno if you saw what Hanada did to that guy, but it was pretty incredible. What was that anyway? Hanada sat fidgeting nearby, cheeks colored at the relatively minor praise. I it's a technique designed to shut down all of the tenkatsu points on a person's body, and also deal a good amount of physical damage. She blinked up at her friends, looking between them and wondering why they looked so stunned. B but I didn't do it right, she continued dully, color fading from her face again. I couldn't even get halfway through it. Hanada, do you realize how fast you were moving? Sasuke asked bluntly, tying off Naruto's bandage as he spoke. If I heard you correctly you just shut off 64 of his tenkatsu, and simultaneously drove him back with the force. Even if you didn't complete it, it was still damn impressive. I was only able to do it with your help, she responded modestly, though flushed again and bowed her head. Are you okay, Naruto-kun? The blonde boy had been smirking between the two of them, though tried to hide it as Hinata turned towards him, her milky eyes showing concern. Yeah, I'm alright. That guy was pretty tough, but I kept up okay I think. Just wasn't careful enough to avoid his claws, I guess. I think the poison's out of my system, though. He stood slowly to emphasize the point, offering a hand to Hinata as he did. She took it with a nod, trying not to blush more than she already was. Kakashi was just standing back from the tree that now held the assassins hostage. Tazuna-san, Kakashi began slowly, eyes staying fixed on the two attackers. Do you know why I allowed everyone present to believe I had been killed? Tazuna shook his head, a bead of sweat making its way slowly down from his temple. I wanted to see what they were after. Any Junin worth his salt would have noticed the puddle they were concealed within, it hasn't rained in days. The two prisoners glowered and growled, though quieted at a hard look from their captor. These two are the demon brothers, Chunin level ninja from the hidden mist. Kakashi turned towards Tazuna now, his eye boring a hole through the man. Is there a reason these two were after you? I, I'm not sure what you mean, the bridge builder responded, voice a little too high to be sincere. I think you do, Kakashi returned flatly. You hired us for a C rank mission. If we had known you were being pursued by other ninjas, this would have been at least a B rank mission, and an expensive one at that. You might have a good reason for withholding information, but if it puts my team in danger then I have no choice but to call off this mission. Wait, please. A desperate edge in the old man's voice made Kakashi stop after he had turned away. The Junin glanced back, raising an eyebrow in question. You're right, he sighed, casting a look towards the assassins. My country is poor, and we couldn't afford to pay for a high-ranking mission. 
I didn't think Gato would go this far, but... Gato. Kakashi interrupted, blinking several times as he turned to face Tazuna again. The billionaire and president of the Gato company. The one and only, Tazuna replied bitterly. He came to our lands about a year ago, and has been a terror ever since. He employs gangs and ninjas to curb lands to his will, and he's after me now because of the bridge I'm building to the mainland. Anyo, sir. Hanada ventured cautiously, looking anxious. Why is a bridge such a threat to Gato? Attempts on your life seem extreme for such a thing. In a nutshell, Gato controls the shipping industry. That's how he got rich in the first place. If our country gained access to the mainland by means other than ships, it would threaten his hold on our nation. That's why I needed to make sure I was protected. Without me, the bridge can't be completed, and with such pressures already in place no one else will step forward to continue the project. It may seem dramatic, but without me our country may shrivel and die, sucked dry by Gato's greed and malice. A long minute passed after the old man's speech, his dark eyes pleading as they went to each of them in turn. I know what I did was wrong, but I had no choice, for the sake of my village, for the sake of my family. We're not unsympathetic, Kakashi sighed, a hand lifting back to rub at the back of his neck. But the fact remains that you put my team, three genins, newly promoted ninjas, in danger because of your deceit. I don't have a choice but to terminate the mission. We can protect you and bring you back to the village, but from there you'll have to put in a proper request. Sensei. His village can't afford to pay the fee. It was Naruto's turn to speak now. He had been listening to the exchange, flexing his hand as he considered the situation. Uruka sensei always said that a ninja should always help when somebody deserving is in need. I don't want to just leave his village to that jerk Gato, do you? Hanada looked for a moment at Naruto, biting at her lower lip, before she turned and nodded her agreement to Kakashi. I agree with Naruto, but only if he's going to be straight with us from here on out. I don't want any more surprises like that, Sasuke interjected coolly. Kakashi looked intently from one of his students to the other, considering their words before sighing again. You three know the kind of danger this mission now offers. These two may have been Chunin level, but they were experienced assassins. Seeing more of them, or even a Junin wouldn't be out of the question. You're still willing to go on. It took a little longer than it might normally for them to respond, but three nods of affirmation came quickly enough. He sighed again. Tazuna, wait with them. I'm going to have a talk with our new friends here. Without waiting for a reply Kakashi turned, vanishing in a cloud of white smoke, the two captive ninja mysteriously gone with him. Well, may as well go over the recap like we would in training, Sasuke started after a moment, plopping down to wait for Kakashi. Hanada, you first, you had a better view of Naruto and I during the initial attack. On his cue the other two sank to the ground, facing one another with a good amount of room between. Like Kakashi sensei said, your reaction was what saved us. Your aim was perfect as usual, but your jump was off a little. If you had landed a little in front of them instead of on their arms, you could have kicked them back and off balance without sacrificing your own positioning, and maybe engaged the other before he could get to Tazuna. Despite her usual demure self, this was something Hanada had gotten used to from training with her friends. They could all offer one another constructive criticism and not worry about feeling bad for it. She couldn't help the slight blush as she addressed Naruto, however. Naruto-kun, I think Sasuke realized it faster than either of us that you were the next target after Kakashi-sensei. If you had picked it out quicker you may have been able to avoid the attack without Sasuke's help. But you recovered well, and like he said you were right to engage and keep the one away from us. Just be a little more cautious of what kind of weapons your opponent is using. Naruto and Sasuke both nodded at the appropriate parts, taking in their friends' comments before discussing between themselves briefly. Guess we were all on the same page, Naruto said with a small grin, turning to Hinata and shoving her shoulder lightly. You're the only one who did everything perfect. He had expected her to flush and deny it, but she simply shook her head. If I had completed the technique he wouldn't have been able to move at all, and we could have helped you. Well, Sasuke could have. Because of me, Kakashi-sensei had to come back in to save us. She trailed off, shoulders rolling very slightly in a shrug. 
I should have been able to do it. Young lady, I'm not sure what you did, but it was the most impressive thing I've ever seen. Not only did you remain calm in that situation, but you protected me, and with the finesse of one far beyond your age. Hanada blinked up at the old man that had addressed her, his broad smile proof that he had reassessed his opinion of the trio. You should be proud. Tazuna-san is right, Hanada, Sasuke agreed. If you really want some criticism all I can give is that you should practice that more. Your body obviously isn't used to it, and I've never seen anything like that when we spar. I'm sure if you put some work into it you'd be able to master it before long. You're faster than either of us, so I bet it's just a matter of conditioning so your muscles can handle the stress. The Hyuga girl looked from one of her friends to the other, and up to Tazuna, before finally allowing herself a small smile, ducking her head before anybody could see the red creeping into her cheeks. Thankfully, Kakashi returned shortly thereafter, saving her from the embarrassment. They didn't betray much. All I could learn was that there are more of them in whatever organization they belong to, or maybe just other mercenaries Gato has hired. None of them asked what happened to the assassins after the questioning. Tazuna-san, as Sasuke said, if we are to continue this mission you will need to share any and all information you have with us. Is there anything else we should know before we continue? Only that we will be on our own. Gato's gang has the town beaten down, and nobody dares challenge his authority. I don't know any specifics about who he's hired, aside from the fact that he's contracted ninjas to kill me. All right. Naruto, Sasuke, Hanada, I'm upgrading this mission to high B rank as of now. You are to be combat ready at all times. Hanada will stay on point. Activate your Byakugan every five minutes to scan ahead and all around us. At the first sign of danger, form up around Tazuna in the swastika formation. I will handle any threats from here on out, understood. A sharp chorus of affirmation from Team 7 elicited a nod from Kakashi. Good. Let's move out. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. We're sharing a tent. Naruto had a look on his face that was somewhere between incredulous and embarrassed. Kakashi, who had just finished delivering the news, blinked up at the boy quizzically before shaking his head and returning to erecting his own tent. Didn't they tell you when you were at the academy? A ninja is a ninja. Male or female makes little difference in the field, and most times you won't have the luxury of separate accommodations anyway. You three are small enough to share a tent between you, and besides, don't you live with Hanada already? Kakashi's mask covered his mischievous smirk. As far as he was concerned they were far too young to worry about in the first place, but there was no harm in teasing for something the boy wouldn't understand. As expected, more color rose in Naruto's features. Well yeah but we don't sleep in the same room, he muttered, turning away and walking back to his friends. He shrugged and shifted back and forth on his feet before speaking, trying not to look as uncomfortable as he felt. Kakashi says we have to share a tent, he only brought two. They both blinked back at him, though Sasuke didn't seem perturbed. Hanada, though, traversed the color spectrum more rapidly than he thought was possible. Sasuke and I can just sleep outside, there's plenty of trees around. Right Sasuke. The Uchiha boy shrugged and nodded, turning back to finish putting up their tent. And no, Hanada said quickly, waving her hands in front of her. It's all right, are really. I mean, we've been friends for years, it's not a big deal. She trailed off lamely, more red rising to her cheeks and ears. Naruto looked at her curiously for a moment, then shrugged, scratching at the back of his neck. All right, if you say so. Here, let me help Sasuke. He rushed to the opposite side of the tent, both legitimately to help his friend and also for an excuse to get away from the awkward conversation. Uruka had gone over some things with him over the years, including certain behavior that was expected with girls. It was only recently that he had started to notice that Hinata was, in fact, female. Like she said, they had been friends since childhood, and it had never mattered before. Less than an hour later they sat in a circle around a campfire, the flames set low in a dugout hole. Kakashi was reading one of his little books while his team cleaned and sharpened the equipment that had been used that day. A small boar had been caught for the night's meal and now sat on a spit over the fire. You three never told me you could cook, Kakashi mused, not looking up from his reading. 
I expected Hinata to have been taught at some point, but not you too. Aruka sensei said I should learn some simple stuff for missions, and in case he wasn't home. Most of it is just seasoning, though, like the rub for this one, Naruto responded modestly, showing Kakashi the small bag of herbs and salts he had ground and used to season the meat. I made this one before we left. I've lived alone for a while, Sasuke said evenly, leaning back from a handful of wild vegetables he had finished chopping. He slid a portion of each onto five plates while Hinata began cutting from the spit, making sure each dish had a sizable chunk or two of meat before passing them to Kakashi and Tazuna. I almost feel like this is cheating, having three longtime friends on the same team. They even cook using teamwork. Kakashi shook his head and thanked Hinata before settling down to eat. All three had stopped questioning how the Junin managed to eat without them ever seeing his face. Sometimes his food just vanished, as if he had employed his ninja training in eating just as well as in combat. Other times it disappeared bit by bit, presumably when absolutely nobody was looking his way. Tonight was the latter method. Damn good, Tazuna praised through a mouthful of pork, grinning at the three genin and shaking his head. I was wrong about you three, and I apologize for what I said before. I've seen how you handle yourselves in a fight, and now I'm very glad to say I've seen how you can cook. He barked out a raucous laugh before tearing off another piece of meat. Their reaction to his words was as expected. Naruto beamed and smiled broadly, Sasuke shrugged and sipped water from a canteen, and Hinata ducked her head. We'll be on the move again by dawn. Kakashi's voice came to them through the light tent fabric, ripples spreading from where he flicked the material from the outside. Naruto, Sasuke, and Hinata were inside, setting out bedrolls and preparing to sleep. We need to meet Tazuna's contact at 9 a.m., so that he can escort us across the strait to wave country. No dawdling in the morning. Moments later the glow of the campfire faded in a torrent of hissing, followed shortly by the sound of earth shifting to swallow up the pit. Naruto yawned and crawled onto the center roll, shrugging out of his sleeveless coat and folding it where his head would be to act as a pillow. After slipping out of his dark Jackie Tabi, something Uruka had encouraged him to pick up after Naruto had voiced his dislike for sandals, he settled on his makeshift bed, lifting a hand to his shirt collar before stopping abruptly. He glanced sideways at Hinata, who was turned towards the entrance of their tent removing her footwear. He shrugged to himself then, quickly slipping out of the grey t-shirt. It's hot, and Hinata won't care, Sasuke and I have trained without shirts before. Hinata mimicked her friend, folding and turning to put down her coat, something that was getting all too warm to be wearing this time of year. She turned to move to the head of her bedroll and froze, blinking at Naruto and Sasuke. They had both casually removed their shirts while she had been turned. Sasuke lay already dozing on his side, back to the two of them. Naruto hadn't yet fallen asleep, but he was lying on his back, eyes half-lidded and muttering something about ramen. She sat there for a moment, color rising in her face for the umpteenth time that night, before shaking her head and forcing the heat away. No different than training, she said to herself again and again as she lay down but it wasn't the same, for some reason. Even as her friends quickly succumbed to sleep she stayed awake for a time, trying to reason out thoughts and feelings until exhaustion finally won over. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Naruto stifled a yawn as they walked, keeping his eyes on the woods and doing his best not to think about that morning. He had woken first and blinked his eyes open mere centimeters from Hinata's face, it had been all he could do to stay quiet and slowly sit back and up. The experience, coupled with the previous night's awkward conversation, had given him enough thought to muddle through the whole morning. It was something he had resigned to talk to Aruka about when they returned. As Kakashi had promised, they arrived at the meeting point just before nine. Trees thinned out to reveal a narrow strand of beach, though they could see only a few meters through the thick fog coming off of the sea beyond. A man stood on the shore next to a small wooden boat, its bow half buried in the sand. Without wasting any time they made hasty introductions and were aboard, shoving off from the land and delving into the curtain of mist. The short journey across the channel was uneventful, save for the appearance of the bridge looming out of the haze above them. Is that your bridge, Tazuna-san? Naruto asked curiously, eyes a little wide in wonder. It was enough that the youth, 
like his friends, had never been allowed outside of the village. Such structures were awe-inspiring. Aye, that's it. That's our village's hopes and dreams. No further conversation was to be had. The fog felt ominous, in a way. It held the same effect as a dark room, where people whispered on instinct even when there might not be a reason to. It was like a living entity, one that demanded a respectful silence. The whiteness broke suddenly as they entered a low tunnel, emerging on the other side to clear skies and open blue water into what seemed like an artificial lagoon. Their guide docked the boat at a nearby wooden platform, ushering them off quickly and looking around nervously. Thank you, Tazuna said solemnly, nodding to the man. His only response was a curt nod, more glances in around, and the roar of the engine starting as he peeled away from the dock. As you can see, the old man continued dryly, turning towards the path that ran off into the woods, people are scared to even be seen with me. Can't blame them, though, Gatos got the whole village scared. That'll change once we're through, Naruto stated confidently, grinning from Tazuna's side. The words earned him a smirk from their client. Come on, let's get you back home mister. The sooner we get back the sooner that jerk Gato will get what's coming to him. Tazuna couldn't help but chuckle at the boy's assurance, shaking his head but starting down the road without further encouragement. Several kilometers of walking later Hanada stopped, raising a small fist in the air to signal a halt. Kakashi appeared next to her, speaking quietly. What is it? He murmured, his eye scanning the trees in the direction the girl was looking. Her Byakugan was active and she staring intently ahead. There's somebody in the trees ahead, maybe 300 meters ahead. No, 325 meters. I can't make out many details, but he's tall, and has a huge sword on his back that's longer than he is. Sasuke and Naruto tensed at the same time, drawing out their kunai. Kakashi nodded and stepped in front of Hinata. Good work, he said quietly. Fall back to protect Tazuna, I'll handle him. She nodded and fell in with her team in the swastika formation, a kunai of her own already in hand. Meanwhile Kakashi proceeded at the same pace, eyes ahead and taking mental note of where the enemy was. Inform me if he moves. The party proceeded 300 meters before Hinata spoke again, a rapid whisper to their instructor. He's coming this way, though I don't think he's heading towards us. He should appear 10 meters ahead of us. As if on cue, a form blurred into their path, blocking their advance. The man that now stood before them was tall indeed. He wore no shirt, only pinstriped trousers held up by modified suspenders. Black and white leg and arm warmers adorned each limb, and bandages covered most of his face. Kakashi cocked his head to the side, feigning calm as he spread his hands to his sides. Momochi Zabuza, eh? Kakashi drawled, still apparently relaxed and bored. Last I heard you were exiled from the hidden mist and put in their bingo book. Failed coups will do that, I hear. Hataki Kakashi, the Leaf's infamous copy ninja. Your party's packing quite the ocular punch, and Uchiha and a Hayuga. Unless the boy just likes the old clan symbol. Zabuza matched his adversary's posture, feigning nonchalance while every muscle in his body was poised for action. I didn't even bother with an ambush, the girl would have warned you anyway. Any chance you'll want to make this easy and just hand the old man over. Tempting offer, but no thanks. Kakashi responded coolly, hand moving lazily to lift his forehead protector from the always hidden eye. You three protect Tazuna, I'll handle him. They were already set in balanced combat stances, though each watched their teacher with interest. None of them had ever seen that eye, and had never thought to ask why it was hidden. Zabuza sighed and shrugged, the motion loosening the massive blade that hung on his back. As you wish, but don't think I'm going to let you use your Sharingan that easily. A noise escaped Sasuke's lips, something between a gasp and a growl. But there was little time to discuss the cause of his unrest. Zabuza vanished and reappeared several meters back from his starting point, standing atop a small river and channeling his chakra. In seconds a thick mist rose from their surroundings, coating the air even thicker than the fog covering the sea. Kakashi was all but lost from sight, only his outline remaining visible. And then they felt it. Sweat beaded almost immediately on the three Genin and Tazuna alike, and it was not a result of heat or condensation. The air was thick with killing intent unlike any they had ever felt, 
radiating from Kakashi and seeming to emanate from the mist around them. This man was a Junin, and on a whole other level than the Demon Brothers. He had initiated an assault by himself without even hesitating, and he moved with a speed that could rival Kakashi's. This was something entirely out of their league, and they knew it. He can appear anywhere in this mist, and in complete silence. Don't let your guard down for an instant. Kakashi's voice sounded slightly muffled from the mist, but they understood enough to stiffen and continue glancing around warily. Without warning Hinata spun, lashing out behind them with her kanai. Tazuna had been the only one just behind them, but in less time than a blink the new assassin had appeared in the narrow opening, heavy blade ready to strike down all four at once. The kunoichi had reacted first, however, slicing from Zabaza's hip to his shoulder in one fluid movement. Kakashi was there in a heartbeat, but already the form had melted into a puddle of water. Water clone, Kakashi muttered, glancing down to Hinata, who was breathing harder than she ought to be. Calm down, he said with what must have been a reassuring smile. I won't let anything happen to any of, a thick metal blade cut through his torso mid-sentence, slicing the silver-haired Junin in half and preventing him from finishing the sentence. Permanently, or so the horrified Jenin thought. More water splashed onto the ground where Kakashi's body had been. The real one now stood just behind the sword's wielder, Kunai's tip pressed against Zabaza's back just below the left set of floating ribs. Don't move, he said calmly, digging the blade in a little further. Hey, pretty good Kakashi. But you'll need to do more than copy techniques to beat me. Kakashi dropped to the ground before Zabuza had finished speaking, his giant sword sweeping over his head and taking off a few silver hairs. But the missing Nin was fast. In an instant he had spun, a whirling kick striking Kakashi in the jaw. The Sharingan user careened backwards, gritting his teeth just before hitting the water beyond the road. I'll be right back, kids, Zabuza growled, a maniacal grin on the man's face. Then he blurred and was atop the water again, hands moving so fast that they could hardly make out the hand signs. Sweden. Water prison. The technique landed just as Kakashi surfaced. A cascade of swirling water closed on him, capturing and immobilizing the Konoha Junin. Without hesitation Kakashi shouted to his team, words a little distorted but clearly audible. Take Tazuna and run. All three of his genin stood there, stunned and blinking. Had they really seen it? Had Kakashi been captured right in front of their eyes after such a brief yet impressive exchange? He growled and shouted again as Zabuza made a hand sign with one hand, the other emerged in the water prison. He's stronger than I thought. Get away now before. No. Naruto's retort may have been offered louder than necessary, but it got the message across. Kakashi balked and blinked, actions mimicked by Zabuza. We're not leaving an ally behind, Sasuke interjected, trying to stay calm despite the all-too-reasonable fear of death. Hanada could only nod put on her best determined look, which looked all too pale. No, the mist ninja asked, amused. Kakashi, you didn't teach your students very well. Mizu Bunshin no Jutsu. A single copy of Zabuza formed between him and the party of four, eyes turned up in what must have been a grin behind that mask. The clone took over speaking now. I've already captured Kakashi. I hope you realize I can crush you before you take in your next breath. None of them seemed to be paying him much attention. Hanada, stay with Tazuna, Naruto muttered out of the corner of his mouth, quiet enough for only his allies to hear. I'll leave a few clones too. Sasuke, pattern D, but use yourself, and ignore his clone. We have to break him away from the prison or none of us are getting out of here alive. Sasuke nodded, drawing out two fists of shuriken before his friend had even named the plan. The blonde boy faced Zabuza defiantly then, forming the clone seal and roaring, Taju Cage Bunshin no Jutsu. Hanada blinked at the smoke surrounding the small veil. She had seen Naruto perform his clone technique many times, but she had never heard him add that prefix along with it. And now she knew why. A veritable horde of Naruto's now stood in every available space, some even alighting on nearby trees for the lack of space. There had to have been nearly a hundred of them, maybe more, every one of them poised with a kanai and sneering at Zabuza. But her eyes showed her more than just that. Her Byakugan could see a person's chakra circulatory system, as well as the chakra inside of it. 
While there were an incredible number of clones, they all had only a very small amount of chakra, which meant that Naruto himself had spent nearly his whole reserve. From observation she knew that he had more chakra than anybody she had seen, even more than Kakashi, and the fact that he had been able to split the stores between so many and still stand was both incredible and frightening. Naruto. She gasped softly, you can't. I'm fine, he responded roughly. I need to give Sasuke the best distraction I can. Hanada bit her lip hard enough to draw blood and looked away, focusing again on Zabuza as five clones moved in close beside her. Let's go, he shouted, charging forward in a wave of battle cries. Even Zabuza seemed taken aback for a moment. He couldn't look in any direction without seeing a dozen blonde kids charging towards him, dark coats billowing behind them and all brandishing weaponry. Huh, impressive, but my sword was made for. He blinked, watching two fists of shuriken fly out of the horde and straight past the clone. Brats, he muttered, his free arm moving in a blur to deflect each and every projectile. Meanwhile the clone had taken to warding off the swarm, broad blade cutting swaths through the crowd, taking out four or five with each swing and sparring one-handed with any that managed to get past. Kakashi watched, helpless to act. It was chaos from his point of view. Naruto's were shouting from every direction, each one acting on its own to take down Zabuza's clone and get past him. The ranks were thinning quickly, but he knew what their plan was. They had a chance. A Fuma shuriken whirred out of the din, on course to cut the real Zabuza down. He rolled his eyes, twisting his body and catching the spinning blade deftly in his free hand. But just as Kakashi expected, a second was hot on the other's heels, hidden in the other's shadow so perfectly that even he had not seen it. That's Sasuke, for you. Zabuza's eyes went wide, and for the briefest moment Kakashi thought they had won. Nice try. The assassin brought his legs up to his chest in a standing jump, allowing the deadly weapon to pass directly under him. Game over, Kakashi smirked. Zabuza snarled and turned, but it was too late. Just like when they had taken the bell from Kakashi, the Fuma shuriken burst into a cloud of smoke and Sasuke had emerged from it. Two kanai were already heading straight for Zabuza's head and back, another fist of shuriken following closely after. He had no choice but to dodge, lest he want his life to end at the hands of a child. With a guttural growl Zabuza tore his arm from the water prison, releasing the technique and allowing the projectiles to pass by him, though not without getting nicked by one or two. He brought the caught shuriken back for a throw, aiming at Sasuke with unmistakable rage in his eyes. You. Fool. I don't think so. Kakashi's voice came low and dangerous, his vice-like grip closing in around Zabuza's wrist. You'd better believe I won't underestimate you again. Sasuke. Even before the call the Uchiha was rushing forward, feet flying across the water with a kanai bared to strike at the enemy. Zabuza glanced back to his clone but it was dissolving into water after one of the few dozen remaining Naruto's got a knife into its side. More were now sprinting towards the river. Suddenly Zabuza's body jerked, going into a brief spasm before he simply started to fall towards the water. Kakashi's head whipped around to a nearby tree, allowing the body to fall limp into the stream. Sasuke stopped short skidding to a halt and looking wide-eyed at his enemy's neck. Two long sanban protruded from the back of the man's neck, apparently having killed him instantly. As suddenly as the conflict had begun, it ceased, the thundering of clone footsteps dying down as they realized what had happened. The area was silent for a long moment before a voice spoke from the tree Kakashi was regarding with narrowed eyes. Sorry about that, came the calm voice. A short, androgynous-looking ninja stood on a branch of the tree face concealed by an anbu mask with the hidden mist symbol at the forehead. But I couldn't risk him getting away and you had him still for me. The newcomer inclined his head to Kakashi before continuing. The mist thanks you for your assistance in taking down one of its most wanted exiles. You're a hunter nin from the hidden mist, Kakashi said warily, straightening slowly. Why did you wait so long to kill him? I only just arrived on his trail, I've been tracking his movements for days. I got here just as the water prison broke and was waiting for a clear path, which was only just provided. Without waiting for approval the hunter vanished in a swirl of wind and leaves, reappearing beside the fallen man to reach down and feel for a pulse. He is deceased. 
would you care to confirm it before I dispose of the body? There was a certain amused, yet cold tone that the young man, or woman, spoke with. Kakashi knelt to feel Zabaza's neck. He's dead. Go ahead. With a curt nod the masked ninja leaned down, lifting the much larger man onto one shoulder and turning to regard Kakashi again. Best of luck in your mission. I apologize on behalf of my village for the trouble Zabuza has caused you. He raised a hand in a seal, and in another swirl of wind was gone. An eerie quiet fell over the scattered group, lasting for a long minute before Kakashi sighed, lowering his Hitai 8 back to its normal position. Status, he asked tiredly as he and Sasuke made their way back to the others, the group of Naruto's letting them pass while they looked around cautiously. Tazuna-san is safe, as are Naruto and I, Hanada said shakily, calming down slowly. Sasuke didn't take any damage either. Are you all right, sensei? Yes, thanks to you all, he beamed, looking at each of them in turn. I guess I shouldn't be impressed by now that you all can think on your feet, but well done. Dinner's on me when we get back to Konoha. Hanada almost giggled, and Sasuke even allowed himself a small smirk. I appreciated the sentiment when you challenged Zabuza, Naruto, but next time you don't have to be so dramatic. To his surprise, Naruto didn't respond immediately. Or at all. Naruto. Kakashi turned in time to see the remaining shadow clones go up on a cloud of smoke, the original falling forward in what seemed like slow motion. He didn't even have time to think about moving before Hinata was at Naruto's side, catching him before he struck the ground. Sasuke was right behind her, kneeling by his friend and looking worried. Naruto. Hanada breathed, lowering him carefully down and turning him over. His eyes were closed, breathing shallow, and his face was ashen with a cold sweat had breaking on his brow. Naruto. Chapter 7. Precious people. Wake up. Naruto winced at the thunderous noise, head pounding with the worst headache he'd ever experienced. Leaden eyelids creaked open to a thankfully dull room, and for a long while all he could do was lay there, half submerged in an eerily familiar liquid. Had he been here before, the ceiling was lost in darkness far above, and shadows played high along the wall. It wasn't until his half-lidded eyes found the colossal metal bars that he sat bolt upright in sudden realization. He regretted the movement immediately, clutching at his head and stomach as the world spun for a few minutes. Slow down, the reverberating bass voice growled, you nearly died. Again, a touch of amusement touched the grating voice, though the words resounded with anger. How? Naruto asked weakly, one eye moving slowly up to meet the red glow of the Kyuubi's eyes. Fool. Surely you were taught that chakra exhaustion can kill you. What did you think would happen if you summoned as many clones as you were capable of creating? The demon's growl had turned from angry to mocking, eliciting an annoyed shrug from Naruto. I've never had to worry about my chakra before, everybody always says I have more than most people. You really are as dumb as you look. The only reason you have so much chakra is because I'm here. Naruto blinked at that, raising a quizzical eyebrow. The room shook and a sound like an avalanche reverberated through the chamber. It took him a moment to realize that the Kyuubi was laughing at him. You're not special, kid, just lucky. In order to contain me you had to develop larger chakra coils, something that happened gradually over your life. The result was a higher chakra capacity, but it's not unlimited like you seem to think, even if my chakra is mingling with yours more freely these days. Naruto felt like vomiting. Well, more than he had already, at least. Lucky. He muttered, scowling at the rippling reflections in the water. I'm lucky to have you here. Lucky to be an orphan. Lucky to have the whole village hate me because of you. He spat the words with all the vehemence he could muster. The corners of his eyes stung as tears threatened to fall. The mocking laughter continued. You've hardly lived a decade and think you know something of hardship, boy. The words stung and deepened the blonde's glower. You are the way you are today due to your menial suffering. You are stronger for it. Don't wallow in the past and feel sorry for yourself, mortal. Naruto shook his head and opened his mouth to speak, but was cut off. You think I don't understand. The roar increased in volume, unbridled fury and contempt filling every syllable. I'm forced to live inside of you, a prisoner for the rest of your damned life, and will ultimately die with you. I've been here since the beginning, 
I've heard every sound you've heard, seen every scene you've witnessed, felt everything emotion you've experienced. I know more about you than you do. What makes you think I don't understand? Naruto blinked again. He'd never considered that. It wasn't nearly enough to feel sorry for the fox, but it was enough to make him think twice before he assumed anything else. Sorry, he said finally. It was the Kyuubi's turn to blink this time. The two luminous eyes shifted sideways, one rising over the other in what must have been a massive head cocking to the side. What? That sounds like it sucks. I know you're a demon, and that you destroyed my village once upon a time, and and that I killed countless villagers, including your parents. The voice sneered. A rumbling that could only be a cackle filled the air. I don't need your sympathy, mortal child. My. Naruto choked, staring at the Kyuubi. His bright blue eyes flickered to violet, wavering into the darkest indigo. How could he not have considered it? Mizuki had told him that the Kyuubi had attacked on the day he was born, and he had never known his parents. Looking back it seemed obvious, and achingly painful. Unbeknownst to him, the boy's irises were taking on an increasingly reddish hue, pupils beginning to twitch and writhe. Calm down, the fox demon sighed, you'll have your chance later. I need to give you a warning before you wake up. Naruto could hardly think straight, but noted the words enough to snarl towards the voice. You seem like a reckless kid. I know you don't care what happens to me, but I have a vested interest in your survival. Next time you use up all of your chakra like that, you'll probably die. I was barely able to pry the seal open enough to siphon a sliver of chakra into you, and it was all that kept you alive. Naruto blinked again at that, but didn't lessen any of the malice he was projecting at the creature. Next time you feel like doing something stupid, try discussing it with me first and maybe I can stop you from killing yourself. Time passes differently in here. This conversation has taken only a fraction of a second in the real world. Who were they? He asked quietly, voice a forced calm through clenched teeth. Who were my parents? His ears were met only with more deep, echoing cackles that faded into the recesses of his mind. The world began spinning, and Naruto started shouting, a furious scream directed at the Kyuubi no Kitsun. He carried on until his thoughts were once again swallowed in darkness, but no matter how loud he yelled the taunting laugh of the fox never left his mind. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Naruto. Snap out of it and calm down. Kakashi's voice rang out clear, followed swiftly by a sharp pain to his cheek. Color swirled outward from the center of his vision, the world filling in again until it reached the edges. Naruto blinked several times as the room he was in seemed to sway back and forth before a gentle hand pressed against his chest and pushed him back down, he had apparently been sitting upright and thrashing about in his sleep. From what could be seen he was in a small room, laying on a comfortable bedroll. The walls were bare wood and few furnishings beyond a desk and a dresser occupied the area. A bedroom, he thought blearily, fighting against the painful pressure between his eyes. Didn't have to hit me. He finally mumbled, licking at his chapped lips. What happened? You fell unconscious after the skirmish with Zabuza. According to Hinata you had almost no chakra left, and you should have died. Kakashi seemed calm, but there was a hint of concern in his words. I told you that version of the technique was forbidden for a reason, you didn't have to make so many. To be fair, Sasuke said dryly, grinning very slightly despite himself, we might not have pulled it off otherwise. The chaos he caused was vital to the plan, and we may not have saved you if he had made too few. Call it a calculated risk. Kakashi shook his head before taking a firm tone. Look, I know that you think what you did was necessary, and I'll admit it worked out this time, but it could just have easily killed you. Not to mention, if your plan had failed you would have all died. He let that sink in for a moment before continuing. If ever I tell you to run again, do it, and don't argue. Understand. No, sensei, Naruto said tiredly, trying to move again. That same gentle hand pushed him down a second time, though his aching limbs didn't argue. You taught us yourself that those who abandon their comrades are worse than scum. None of us were going to leave you there, so you can forget about it. Just try not to get caught again. He tried his hand at a laugh but it came out as a rasp. By the way, how long have I been unconscious? Almost two days. Hanada spoke this time, 
her voice quiet and tense. He realized then that it had been her hand making sure he hadn't moved around, and it was still resting lightly on his chest. She sat next to him, legs folded beneath her and leaning forward slightly. The veins surrounding her eyes were receding, but even as they vanished he could see dark lines left in their wake, like thick spider webs just under the skin. They, like the dark circles under her eyes, contrasted sharply with her pale features. Hanada, Sasuke, Kakashi said quietly, not taking his eye from Naruto. Will you go get some food and water from downstairs? Sasuke looked from his friend to Kakashi once before shrugging and standing, walking towards the door on the far side of the room. Hanada chewed on her lower lip for a moment, before nodding quickly and rising to follow after him. As soon as the door closed, Kakashi continued in the same subdued tone. She hasn't left your side since we arrived last night. She would have carried you the rest of the way had I not insisted on doing it. Naruto said nothing, staring blankly at the ceiling. Sasuke has tried to pretend he hasn't been worried, but he's been up here to check on you as often as he could when not on duty protecting Tazuna. Your friends truly care about you, Naruto. If for no other reason, that is why you should be more careful. The boy blinked towards him, obviously not yet comprehending. You're right about what I said, and I think you made the right decision in the end. But when you put your life in danger, when you choose a course of action that could kill you, it's not you that suffers most. It's those close to you. Naruto lowered his head back to the pillow, eyes returning to the wooden ceiling. They were shimmering slightly in the light. Just remember that, Naruto. I had the same talk with the other two. I want to thank you, as I thank them, for saving my life, as well as for saving each other's. If you won't run, which I can't blame you for deciding, at least remember to be cautious, and understand your own limits. He got a nod out of the blonde, causing him to grin and ruffle the boy's hair. The door opened and Hanada came through, carefully carrying a plate and two canteens presumably filled with water. It appeared that Sasuke had not returned with her. Kakashi didn't have to hide the knowing look, taking the mask for granted as he stood and stepped away from his student. You'll be out of commission for another few days while you recover. Try not to move too much until tomorrow, I'll be back to check on you in the morning. With that he winked at Hanada, an action that was almost missed entirely due to him having only one eye to work with. The door closed behind him a moment later, leaving only Naruto and Hanada in the dimly lit room. She set the plate down carefully, laying one of the canisters of water beside it. The other she brought to his side, sitting down again before unscrewing the cap and settling a straw inside. Naruto groaned and tried to sit up, but the same patient hand kept him down before moving to help lift his head to the straw. Despite his condition he managed to blush a little, more embarrassed than anything that he had to be helped to drink. He sipped slowly at the water, resisting the urge to take too much too fast. He had learned the hard way that that was a good way to get sick, or simply throw it back up. After about a minute of slow sips he glanced up at Hanada. She hadn't said a word throughout the ordeal, for all the world appearing to be calm and collected. He could see the dark circles under her eyes more clearly now, the lingering veins to either side of her eyes more pronounced. It took him a moment to realize that she must have been far overusing her Byakugan for it to have gotten that bad. He had seen it happen once during a particularly long day of chakra control training, but it wasn't nearly as bad as this. Hanada, R. He struggled for the right words for a moment, working through the headache and still fuzzy thoughts. Are you okay? Smooth as silk. For what felt like a full minute she looked down at him, at some point taking to biting at her lower lip again. He knew it is one of her several nervous habits, but it was starting to look chapped for how often she must have chewed at it over the last day and a half. Kakashi had been right. His head fell back on the pillow suddenly, and before he could think to lift it there was a pressure on his chest quite a bit heavier than the gentle hand that had been there a few minutes earlier. When he did manage to lift his head all he could see was the top of Hanada's head, ebony strands sticking out every which way. She had, more or less, fallen forward onto his chest, burying her face there and clutching tight at the blanket that covered him. His voice caught in his throat and he simply lay there, simultaneously feeling awkward and trying to figure out why he felt like crying all of a sudden. It was another long minute or two before she finally spoke, her voice no louder than a whisper. 
When you woke up, she started, voice trembling, why you were yelling. You sounded so angry, and you were fighting against Kakashi like you. Like you were trying to hurt him. Naruto blinked at that. He remembered the dream with the Kyubi clearly, but he hadn't realized that the line between reality and his mind had been blurred. A in your eyes, N Naruto-kun. Your eyes were red, like they were back then, in the... In the forest. She broke off then, and for a time he wasn't sure if she was crying or simply trembling harder against him. I'm sorry, he said finally, very quietly, the words coming out thick. I had. I had a bad dream. That's not true. Hanada's voice wasn't quite hard, but it was firm in a way he had never heard before. It was a little disconcerting, even. I saw you just after you collapsed. I saw the orange chakra surge into your system. Just now it was rising in you again. I saw it. Her voice trailed off, as if she was uncertain what she had actually seen. I don't know what it was, B but I. She cut off abruptly as Naruto's hand rested upon her shoulder, hesitating a moment before it moved to press against her upper back in a slightly awkward but fierce one-armed hug. Her friend had moved to prop himself up a little against the wall, a movement she hadn't even noticed in her rush to get her words out. Hanada let her hands fall from his chest and tucked her arms beneath him, returning the embrace with just as much fervor. Naruto wasn't sure how long they sat there, or when the tears had started. Or where they had ended, for that matter. All he knew was that at some point Hanada had fallen asleep, the steady rise and fall of his chest matching her own before long. It was clear that she had been even more exhausted than he, and if what Kakashi had said was true then she needed the rest. He carefully pulled a blanket from beside the bedroll, unfolding it with one hand and using the other to tug it gently over his friend's slumbering form. The last thing he remembered before drifting off was that it was time to be honest with Hinata and Sasuke. After this mission was over, he'd tell them about the Kyubi, consequences be damned. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. So you're telling me that you slept together like that, and nothing happened? Sasuke asked dubiously, exaggerating the tone just to see if he could get Hinata to turn a deeper shade of red. The normally withdrawn boy got a kick out of teasing her. It was one of the few things that still made him laugh, even if it was only a small chuckle. Not even a little peck on the cheek. No, she said frantically squeezing her eyes shut and clamping her hands over her ears. I mean, yes, nothing Sasuke. Hanada wasn't actually speaking very loudly, although she was doing her best to convey her protests through hushed tones. She dropped her hands to her sides and continued intently examining the stone floor, trying not to think about when Sasuke had come to get her that morning. He had already taunted her about it several times over the course of the morning and early afternoon, making sure to describe to her how cute it looked. He'd also never neglected to mention the bit of drool she had been accumulating at the corner of her mouth. Whatever you say, Hanada, he sighed, nodding sagely. You two did look pretty cute and comfy there. As expected, the poor girl went from critical to nuclear in the color department. All right, all right, I'll stop. Kakashi sent me to relieve you. She nodded without looking at him, which made him roll his eyes. Come on Hanada, it's obvious you like him, and have for a while. Just tell him already. I see can't. She squeaked, finding her voice finally only to cover her mouth a moment later. I I mean I don't. We're friends. Sasuke gave her a flat look, then raised a hand and flicked her lightly between the eyes. The simple action made her flinch, then sigh and deflate, falling to sit on the railing just behind her. It's not. That's simple. That was true enough, at least. Sure she had admired Naruto for years, and had some unspoken affection for him for some time, but they had also been friends for nearly six years. Not to mention they were living in the same apartment now and any admission would complicate things. Sasuke shrugged but nodded. I know. But he likes you too, I just don't think he's really figured it out yet. Hanada blinked at that, big eyes getting even larger in genuine surprise. Again Sasuke rolled his eyes, moving to lean against the railing a few steps away. She opened her mouth to speak but he held up a hand. There was the shadow of a smirk tugging at his lips. Honestly you're almost as clueless as he is, he sighed, chuckling again as she gave him her best glare. It might have terrified a butterfly. 
Look, maybe it's hard, and maybe it's complicated, but the sooner you confess to him the better. Sasuke's voice took on a serious tone, growing more solemn by the word. We all saw how fleeting life can be for a ninja out in the field. She bit her lip and nodded. He hadn't needed to finish the thought. Hanada left the bridge and overseeing Tazuna to Sasuke shortly thereafter, making her way back towards the house and thinking on the advice her friend had given. It all sounded good, and it seemed reasonable, but she was so unsure. Naruto was brave, confident, funny, he was everything she wasn't. She didn't deserve somebody like that, not even as a friend, and let alone as anything closer. How would he react if he knew how she felt? The thought of rejection took a comfortable back seat to the fear of losing one of her only friends. I can't, she reasoned as she wandered towards the house, in no hurry to get back. I'm not. What? Pretty enough. Strong enough. Funny enough. Confident enough. Good enough. The list went on in her head, an all too familiar repetition. Before long she had burrowed thoroughly into misery, stopping at a small grassy bale in the midst of another volatile thought. The sun shone down from above, warming her mind and body alike, a distraction from the downward spiral for a moment at least. She had been standing still, taking in the afternoon sun when she realized that there was another person nearby, almost directly in front of her in fact. Hanada blinked and tensed reflexively before she noted that it was only a girl, dressed in a pale pink kimono with dark swirl patterns throughout. The girl was smiling at her, bowing towards Hanada as soon as she was noticed. I didn't mean to startle you, the girl began, blushing lightly. I was just out gathering herbs and saw you passing by. She tilted her head, concern evident on her features. Is something wrong, by chance? No it's all right, Hanada responded with a demure smile, dipping her head in a polite bow. And nothings. She hesitated. Well, it's something, but not important. She smiled again, though it was only half-hearted. The stranger frowned slightly and tilted her head the other way. Is it about somebody that's important to you? The question was an innocent one, though the way the girl asked it implied that it carried much more weight than it might seem. Hanada blinked at her for a moment, then nodded slowly, trying her best not to flush when she thought about Naruto. The other girl smiled knowingly, and a little sadly, Hanada thought. Ah, it's always hard to handle things when somebody we care about it is involved, isn't it? Yes, she replied, returning the ambiguous smile with one of her own. She took a moment then to assess the stranger, realizing that she couldn't have been much older than herself. The girl was petite, and very pretty, with a smile that made Hanada feel warm inside despite the sadness it carried. Her long, dark hair fell straight down, effortlessly framing a heart-shaped face. Anyo, do you live around here? Oh, and what's your name? Hanada chided herself for the complete lack of civility she had shown, not even exchanging simple pleasantries with a stranger. I'm from far away, she replied, a touch of amusement in her tone. My name is Haku, Hanada blinked. Wasn't Haku more of a boy's name? What about you? I can tell from your hitaiite that you're a ninja, at least. My name is Hanada, she answered though hesitated before responding to the unasked question. I'm also from far away, on a mission for my village. Hanada knew never to reveal where she was from or any details of a mission to an outsider. Missions were even to be kept secret from villagers and only discussed within the team and with authorized parties, such as clients and the Sandane. She had revealed only common knowledge that anyone might assume. I see. Being a ninja is scary, isn't it? Haku seemed almost painfully sympathetic, though she appeared to gain a bit of levity as she continued. Going off around the world on dangerous missions, I mean. And, she ventured, raising an eyebrow, I bet you're also scared for your important person, huh? The girl smiled at Hanada's reaction, a definite blush now, and shook her head, stepping closer and further into the glade. Oh of course, Haku-chan, Hanada stuttered at first catching herself and evening her voice quickly after the hastily added honorific. It's only sensible to be scared, it helps you prepare for what's to come. Haku seemed to sense that the other girl was merely reciting something that had been memorized and repeated numerous times. She shook her head, smiling that sad smile again. I see. You are braver than I, Hanada-chan. You're very pretty, 
too, and I think you possess a strength like few I have ever met. Haku quelled the other girl's oncoming protests with another headshake, her hand rising to lightly touch her fingertips on Hinata's cheek. The Hyuga girl could do little but blink and turn red, muttering something about misconceptions or the time. Haku beamed at her for a moment before returning to her sad smile. Protect your important people, Hinata-chan. I can see you care for them very deeply. Real, pure strength comes from the will to protect those you care for. Don't forget that. With a last knowing, wistful smile, Haku turned and walked back from where she had come, stopping and turning her head to the side at the edge of the clearing. I hope we see each other again soon, Hinata-chan. Oh, she added almost as an afterthought, the first genuine grin spreading over the fine features, and I'm actually a boy, but you can still call me Haku-chan if you really want to. A moment later he was gone, leaving a very confused and very red Hinata in his wake. The encounter had caught her completely off balance, from start to finish. Haku had come and gone in the span of a few short minutes, and in that time she felt like she had come to know the boy in some intimate way. It was like trying to remember a dream the morning after, just a feeling always out of reach. She shook her head, starting at a brisk jog towards Tazuna's house. If anything the brief interaction had instilled her with some amount of hope, somebody's first impression of her had been good. Not only that, but in a way Haku had echoed what Sasuke had told her not twenty minutes earlier. A very small, but very real seed of determination formed inside of her. I can. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Naruto was able to get up and walk for a few minutes, Sasuke reported, sinking onto a chair in Tazuna's small kitchen. It was getting late in the evening, and the rest of the household had retired save for Kakashi. He's eating on his own again, too, that guy sure recovers fast. Um, Kakashi murmured, eyes shifting from his book to the boy. What did you want to talk about, Sasuke? The Uchiha gave him a lengthy, even look before continuing calmly. I want to know why you have a Sharingan, he asked bluntly, eyes hovering over his teacher's hidden eye. It's an Uchiha bloodline trait, and I know for a fact that you're not from my clan, only Itachi and I are left. Despite his practiced calm, Sasuke's eyebrow twitched at the mention of his brother's name. Even Kakashi's eye softened and looked back to his book. The boy said nothing else, watching the Junin until he finally sighed, setting the novel down and turning his full attention to Sasuke. Do you want the whole story, or only why I have it? He asked seriously, making the boy think for a moment before responding. The whole story, I can already assume how you might have gotten a hold of a Sharingan. I want to know why, and the story behind how. Kakashi studied him for a moment before nodding. Sasuke didn't seem angry, only curious and a bit confused. It was only natural that the last surviving member of the Uchiha, at least, the only one not a missing nin, would want to know how an outsider came to be in possession of one of the most powerful dujutsu. I'm not of the Uchiha clan, you're right. As a matter of fact my body can't handle the stress involved with the extended use of the Sharingan, although I've become more conditioned to it over the years. He paused for a long moment, his eye glazing over slightly. Shortly after I became a Junin, we were in the midst of the Third Ninja War. I was tasked to lead a team to destroy a bridge that was vital to our enemy's mobility and communication. Wait, the Third Ninja War? Sasuke asked dubiously, raising an eyebrow at Kakashi. I'm not sure how old you are now, but if I had to guess that would make you a Junin at age. 10. 11. 9. Kakashi responded with a shrug. It was obvious from his posture and expression that he wasn't interested in making a big deal out of it. Sasuke blinked several times, leaning back in his chair with a newfound respect for the man. Something went wrong on our mission, though, and one of our members was captured. Back then, I, he sighed, rubbing a hand over his eye and suddenly looking older and very tired. I thought the laws and guidelines of our village were more important than the lives of my comrades. My other teammate, Uchiha Obito, wanted to go rescue Rin, but I chose to complete the mission instead. He disobeyed my commands and left to help our comrade. He was quiet for a long while then, I still unfocused and bearing a detached expression. I thought. Sasuke began cut off almost immediately by Kakashi. I didn't always believe what I do now. 
There was a time that I valued a mission objective more than I did the lives of my team and friends. Despite the faraway look, there was a note of regret evident in the man's tone. It was enough to make Sasuke close his mouth and decide not to interrupt further. But Obito changed my mind in the end. To make a long story short, we fought our way into the cave Rin was being held in, and I lost my eye in the skirmish. One of our enemies brought the cave down on us, and Obito sacrificed his life to save mine. He was quiet for a moment, and after a time his eyes refocused on Sasuke. In his last moments he imparted his Sharingan to me. Rin transplanted it herself using a special medical ninjutsu, and we were able to escape with the help of our sensei, Namikaze Minato. Your teacher was the Yandaimi. Sasuke blurted out, eyes widening a little. I though that was before he became Hokage. At the time, however, he was known as Konoha's Yellow Flash. Kakashi watched his student for a few minutes. Sasuke was mulling the information over, nodding to himself once or twice before readdressing Kakashi. All right, thanks, Kakashi-sensei. The older ninja nodded, and after a moment's hesitation Sasuke continued. Do you think, once I awaken my Sharingan that you could help me learn how to use it? I was always told it would come naturally, like an innate ability, but I ah. He trailed off, searching for words that wouldn't entirely give away his intent. I feel like there's more to the Sharingan than that, he finished a bit lamely, looking away. Kakashi stared at him for a few seconds, wondering what secrets the boy was hiding. I can, he ventured tentatively, not wanting to commit fully to the request just yet. That is, assuming the Sharingan manifests itself in you. It will, Sasuke replied firmly, with a fierceness he had not intended. It was one of the few times Kakashi had ever heard that much emotion in the boy's voice. It has too. Again a considerable time passed as they looked at one another, Sasuke with his determined expression and Kakashi with a calculating look. All right, I'll teach you what I can when the time comes, on one condition. Sasuke raised an eyebrow. If I tell you I won't teach you something, you don't question me. I expect you to trust I have good reason for it. Understand. The Uchiha nodded slowly, shrugging noncommittally at the same time. He had little choice if he wanted an experienced Sharingan user as a mentor, and he could cross the Forbidden Bridge when it came to that. Sasuke slid into his bedroll a few minutes later, turning over the conversation in his mind. He, Kakashi, and Hinata were sharing a room to give Naruto some peace and quiet to recover, though Hinata would be late coming down from attending to Naruto and Kakashi liked to read into the night sometimes. He knows, Sasuke thought to himself as he forced his mind to clear and be at ease. He knows I want to know more about the Mangeku Sharingan. There's got to be another way to activate it, there has to be. Naruto's words, spoken after the Uchiha massacre, rang through his head, and he couldn't help but smile faintly. If it's not possible, it's not possible, but I won't give up on getting stronger no matter what. I'm coming for you. One day, Itachi. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. I still can't leave, Naruto asked indignantly, looking crestfallen. It's been four days since we got here. Hanada says my chakra is almost back to normal and all I've done is rest. One more day. Just to be safe, Kakashi chided sternly, adding in a cautionary measure a moment later. Besides, remember what we talked about. Zabuza may still be alive. The way that Hunter Nin handled the situation just doesn't sit right with me. We need somebody to stay here and watch Inari and Tsunami. Keep your radio on and call if there's any trouble. Yes, Sensei, he sighed, slumping back down to sit at the dock's edge. Tazuna's house was on the shoreline and Naruto had taken to spending the last few days basking in the fresh sea air while working some minor chakra exercises. Against Kakashi's, and Hanada's, wishes, he had also made sure to keep up a physical regimen as well. Good. We're going to escort Tazuna to the bridge, Hanada and I will be back soon enough. Let's move out. Kakashi turned then, stepping off of the dock and making his way towards the trees. Tazuna and Sasuke were on his heels, and Hinata followed after a moment lingering and glancing back to Naruto. Man, this sucks, the blonde muttered after a few minutes of listening to the morning's sounds. Birds chirped overhead and in the trees, 
planks creaked against the soft breeze, and the surf lapped rhythmically against the sand below. Normally he might find such serenity a welcome escape, but after being put on rest duty, for days he was getting restless. Not to mention that Kakashi had informed them of his concerns about Zabuza the day before, could he really be alive? It sounded plausible, the way his teacher had described near-death states and the Sanban, but Zabuza had seemed so. Well, dead. Before he could get too wrapped up in thought, Inari, Tazuna's grandson, came out of the house, walking over to take a seat next to Naruto. He kept looking towards the ocean, letting the young boy gather his own thoughts. The previous days had been contentious, to say the least, Tsunami's son had been plagued with doubt, defiance, and petulance, spurning Team 7 from the day they had arrived. He was making some progress, though, it was one of the good things that came from staying at the house. Naruto Nichin, he started quietly, looking down at his hands. Yesterday when you said that stuff about Gato and, well, do you really think you can beat him? Naruto looked down at the small boy, his teeth flashing in a broad grin. Hell yeah. Tazuna-san said that they'll be done with the bridge soon, and we've beaten everything that jerk has thrown at us. No problem, Inari. The child stared up at him for a few seconds, tears welling in his eyes before he hurriedly wiped them away with a sleeve. Naruto smiled again and put a hand on Inari's head, ruffling his hair a little. You're a good kid. Remember what I said about crying, though, you've gotta be strong for your mom. But it's all right to cry when you're happy. How do you learn to be so brave? Inari asked through a few sniffles, lowering his sleeve to look up at the older boy that he'd come to respect over the last several days. What if I can't? I had a really good teacher, Naruto laughed. It was true, by and large, though not the whole truth. Inari didn't need to hear the way he had grown up, the kid had already been through enough of his own pain. And I know you can, Inari. You've got it inside of you, just like everyone. You just need to believe it as much as I do. Inari looked doubtful and a little confused, but Naruto noticed neither as the little radio in his ear buzzed. Naruto. Kakashi's voice called, sounding urgent. The frequency was ridden with static and getting worse, the white noise growing louder by the second. Du it, the line continued to break up. The last broken words that came through hardly heard over the din of static. Buza, nth, unter nin. There was a loud pop in Naruto's ear and he had to rip the device away before it ruptured his eardrum. Inari, I have to go. Take your mom and, I don't think so, drawled a bored sounding voice. Naruto whirled towards the shore, where two surly looking thugs stood with their arms folded, each sporting a katana at his hip. Can't believe we got sent to kill a bitch and some kids, the gray-haired one said, rolling his eyes and casually drawing the blade. What's going on out here? The door to the house opened and Tsunami stepped out, blinking in the sunlight. She gasped and stepped back once, hand raising to her mouth in shock. Inari, come inside. The boy looked frightened, his eyes wide, and he stood frozen next to Naruto. I'll get her, the other man, sporting an eye patch, said with a wicked grin, you kill the ninja kid. He stepped casually towards the doorway, beckoning with one hand as he drew the katana with the other. Come on pretty girl, we've got plans for you. He licked his lips and advanced on her, the same disturbing smile on his face the whole way. Before Naruto could stop him Inari had charged forward, shouting in a high-pitched, fearful voice. Why you get away from my mom? He had nothing to defend himself or his mother with, but he ran at the man as fast as he could, fists raised and ready to go down fighting to protect his mother. Luckily, Naruto didn't quite fit the average description of, ninja kid. In a blur of motion he had dashed forward and passed Inari, a fist of shuriken flying at the first thug as he rushed the second. They may have talked tough, but they weren't much higher on the ladder than the average mercenary. The gray-haired man cursed, dodging and deflecting the projectiles while Naruto closed on his partner. Little shits, I patch yelled, bringing his sword down in a strong slash. Naruto deflected it easily with the kunai in his left hand, pivoting and driving a vicious blow into the man's torso. His adversary buckled, and without losing momentum he drove a knee into the thug's nose. The satisfying and sickening crunch of breaking bone and cartilage preceded the thud of the man's limp body striking the wooden porch. 
The other man had charged forward after deflecting the shuriken, but faltered as he saw how decisively Naruto had taken out his companion. The blonde took advantage of the moment's hesitation and flicked a kunai towards him, forcing the bewildered man to dodge, an action that ultimately harmed more than it helped. Naruto leapt from a sprint, calculating the dodge just before the jump in order to land a spinning round kick into the side of his opponent's head. The second would-be assassin fell heavily to the ground, unconscious before he struck the earth. Inari, Tsunami, get these two tied up and then get somewhere safe. He shouted over his shoulder, already running towards the bridge at a dead sprint. The communication had been broken up, but he had heard enough to put the pieces together. Zabuza was alive, and he was at the bridge with the hunter Nin. Kakashi had been right after all. Naruto ground his teeth and willed himself faster as he bounded into the trees, branches groaning under his feet as he forced more chakra into them. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Hanada, take the hunter Nin. Sasuke, protect Tazuna and stay close, Kakashi murmured, pulling his forehead protector up to reveal his Sharingan. I won't lose to Zabuza this time, I promise. His students nodded sharply, already crouched into combat stances as they moved to obey. This mist is messing with the radios, I'm not sure if Naruto will be able to make it as backup, so don't take any unnecessary risks. Haku, Zabuza muttered, too quiet for the others to hear, can you take the girl? It looks like she intends to fight, and I'll need my full attention to handle Kakashi. I didn't see her combat skills in your last skirmish, Zabuza-san, but you know as well as I that it'd be hard for any of them to keep up with me. Except Kakashi, of course. You're no match for him, Zabuza growled, eyeing the Junin that stood calmly ready several meters away. Keep the runts away while I deal with him. Don't get hit by the girl, she can shut down your tenkutsu. Yes, sir, Haku whispered, and then he sped forward. The motion stirred the air around him until it was a veritable maelstrom, surrounding him like a personal tornado. He shot towards Hinata with unnatural speed, using the momentum of the spin the drive a Sanban towards her unguarded side. But she had been ready. Hinata had tracked Haku's movements, her Byakugan active and studying her attacker as he drew close. At the last possible instant she bent backwards, the needle flying over her abdomen and missing by less than a centimeter. She caught herself on one hand and used the force of her movement to turn it into a one-handed back handspring, using the other hand to send a kunai flying at the whirlwind. It deflected but managed to steal Haku's balance, forcing him to grind to a halt in a fighting stance. I don't want to kill you, Haku said softly, bearing a sanban in each hand, but I will if you choose to continue. It's impossible for you to keep up with my speed. I'm sorry, Haku-san, Hanada all but whispered real sadness in her eyes, but will protect my friends with my life, just as you will protect yours. Haku blinked. She had recognized him from the beginning. As you wish, he returned, voice growing hard. He rushed forward, clashing with Hinata and forming one-handed seals with his free arm with blinding speed. Almost at the same moment that sparks flew from their weapons he muttered under his breath, Haijutsu, thousand flying water needles of death. Hanada didn't even have time to be baffled at the fact that he had used only one hand to form seals. As they met Haku stomped his foot down, splashing standing water into the air around them, but it didn't fall as Hanada expected. Instead it twisted and congealed in the air, freezing and turning into hundreds upon hundreds of tiny needles of ice. Guardian 8 Divination Signs, 32 Palms. Hanada gasped as Haku disengaged to allow his jutsu to do its work. Even as the ice flew towards her Hanada's arms were in motion, her palms aglow as chakra gathered within. From her ally's perspective it seemed that her arms simply turned into a blur beneath an odd, hazy dome of pure energy. It took Sasuke a moment to realize that the haze was just chakra, fired at so many points with pinpoint precision that it created the odd illusion around her. Unlike the more advanced jutsu she had attempted before, this was one Hanada knew. It was not as fast as the more advanced variation, but it was enough for the task at hand. Ice shattered in every direction, throwing up hundreds of clouds of mist around her. For a moment she was lost amid the chakra haze and clouds of ice, and Haku had turned his attention towards Sasuke. 
He seemed confident enough in his technique, at least until he was struck by a spinning kick that threw him from his feet with a grunt. Hanada stood where he had just been, breathing slightly labored but otherwise in one piece. She had a few cuts on her arms and legs, but seemed to have blocked or deflected the majority of the needles. Haku skipped across the ground once before rolling into a crouch. If he hadn't been wearing his Anbu mask, they would have all seen his look of shock. Nobody had ever survived at the center of that technique. He would have understood if she somehow escaped it, perhaps leapt straight up or rolled to the side, however unlikely either of those would have been. But she had stood her ground and come out virtually unscathed. The Hyuga girl didn't give him a chance to think it over. She flew towards him in a black and beige blur, and it was all he could do to track her and keep up. The next 30 seconds were maddeningly fast, and before long Hanada had him on the defensive. It was all he could do to dodge and deflect, let alone land a strike. Her strange fighting style was unfamiliar to him, and he was loath to admit it but she was faster than him. A lightning-fast reverse kick finally found Haku's jaw, sending him spinning to land hard on the ground. Hanada set her stance again, and was breathing hard with the strain of keeping up such an assault. But he was in no better shape, especially after that hit. Haku, you're going to lose at this rate, Zabuza said calmly, loud enough for everybody to hear. He hadn't moved throughout the encounter, keeping the two in his peripheral vision while keeping a hard eye on Kakashi. It wasn't necessary to make his move yet. Get serious. Yes, Zabuza sand, I will. As Haku straightened, inclining his head in what could only have been a measure of respect towards Hanada. I apologize, he started quietly, the air around him beginning to visibly shift. I didn't want to have to use this technique, but I have no choice. The air surrounding him turned so cold that Hanada could see the millions of water molecules surrounding him turn to ice, flowing outward as he lifted his hands and pressed them together in a modified tiger seal. Haijutsu. Demonic ice mirrors. The air surrounding Hanada suddenly dropped at least 20 degrees from its already frigid temperature. Before she could take a step towards Haku, a piece of ice thrust upward in front of her, coalescing into a giant crystalline panel. She pivoted and tried to move around it, but more identical mirrors had already half-formed all around her. Even before she had time to blink again they had surrounded her, cutting her off behind a blockade of twelve perfectly symmetrical ice mirrors. More floated above those, leaning inward to form a sort of roof, one final piece closing the very top to escape. Haku moved forward quickly, taking advantage of the moment's confusion. Hanada saw him rush towards one of the mirrors, and then simply melt into it. What should have been solid ice allowed him to flow smoothly in, and then a score of Hakus appeared around her, a perfect image of him reflected on every panel. She couldn't even tell them apart with her by Akugan. Hanada, Kakashi shouted, dashing forward towards the structure. His path was blocked almost immediately by Zabuza who appeared to be grinning behind the bandages on his face. Your fight's with me, Kakashi. That girl's as good as dead anyway, and you can't afford to have me running around unchecked can you? Kakashi growled and crouched, drawing out his kanai. He'd have to make this quick. Sasuke. Support Hinata, he called back sharply. Sasuke blinked several times, about to ask why when three of Naruto's clones landed beside him. He barely hesitated before he rushed around the two Junin. Zabuza twitched sideways but Kakashi just appeared in front of him, forcing the missing nin to block a kanai thrust with his giant blade. Your fight's with me, Zabuza, Kakashi echoed tightly. Sasuke made it to the crystals in seconds, skidding to a halt just on the outside. From what he could tell the images were only on the inside, meaning it might be possible to disrupt them from outside. He kicked at one as hard as he could but it barely shook. Several fists of shuriken and a few kanai told him that weapons wouldn't work against it either. Kaden. Great fireball. Fire roared from his mouth and hit the nearest ice mirror. Nothing happened. The flames splashed against the frozen water and dissipated. Sasuke might as well have blown air on them for all the jutsu had accomplished. Sasuke. He's too fast, cried Hinata from within the mirrors. She was performing the repelling technique again, but now against what appeared to be hundreds of Sanban flying at her from every direction. One or two stuck out from each limb, slowing her movements noticeably and putting her in danger of taking more hits. 
more still protruded from her torso and back. Sasuke didn't even realize he was moving until he was halfway to her, sprinting through the gaps in the ice to aid his friend however he could. Fist after fist of shuriken flew out around Hinata, deflecting incoming Sanban almost at random. Almost. As his heartbeat quickened time felt like it was slowing down, and he could just make out the weapons as they were coming in. And there was something else, too. He's jumping between mirrors, Sasuke growled as he reached Hinata, covering her back and allowing her to focus her defense forward. Of course, covering meant that he was just taking the needles that she might otherwise have to while trying to deflect as many as possible, but at least she was no longer at risk of being hit with her full focus forward. Whatever this ability does it lets him move faster than we can see between the ice. Sasuke's eyes were wide now, trying desperately to pick up on the movement he knew he could see. It was like a dark spot in his eye that, when focused upon, disappeared from view. No matter how hard he tried to follow the movements he couldn't keep up. Hanada cried out behind him as a Sanban passed through her defenses, burying itself near the collarbone. She faltered and fell to one knee as more deadly projectiles thrashed at her from every side. It was all she could do to simply shield her head with her arms. Even if the accuracy was low, there were enough of them flying around to do serious damage if it went on much longer. I have to do something. Sasuke ground his teeth and stepped nearer to Hinata, covering her as much as he could with his own body. Pain lanced up every limb, across his back and chest, and he could feel blood trickling steadily from gashes and punctures around his neck and face. Have to do something. There has to be a way to beat this. If only I could see. Sasuke blinked. His head had stopped spinning, and the world around him was moving so slow that he could see each individual Sanban coming like a fast punch rather than a speeding projectile. He still had to work quickly, but even with burning muscles he deflected every one with a kanai in each hand. But that wasn't the interesting part. It was still little more than a blur, but he saw Haku now. The boy was leaping from mirror to mirror, needles flying from an ice panel every time he reached it before resurfacing and bounding to the next. The movement was so fluid, so rapid that even with the slowed reality he could barely keep track. But he could keep track. Kaden. Great fireball. He roared, timing it and aiming where he thought Haku would be. The Sanban stopped abruptly and Haku was rolling over the ground, flames licking at his left leg. His eyes were wide beneath the mask. It had to have been luck, he reasoned, flinging himself at the nearest mirror and sinking back into it. There was no way the boy caught up to him. Calmly, Sasuke reminded himself raising his kanai again as the onslaught commenced. Once again he battled the Sanban, eyes darting back and forth, tracking the barely traceable movement. He let three more blasts of flame go before another hit caught Haku, though this time it had caught his left shoulder. Impossible, he said shakily, limping back into a mirror and breathing hard. His voice echoed around them as he continued, foregoing his needles for a moment. You shouldn't be able to see me yet you're tracking my movement close enough to strike me. How? The image directly in front of Sasuke took a step back. Those eyes. You really are an Uchiha. Sasuke stared back defiantly, too exhausted to puzzle out the boy's words. If this went on much longer, he'd go down. Hanada. He grunted. We need to get out of here. We need to. He trailed off, going very still as his eyes cast over his friend. She was laying on the ground now, body limp. It didn't look like she was breathing. Sasuke froze for the briefest moment, real terror filling him completely. Sasuke. Hanada. Naruto yelled, sprinting towards the icy prison. He could see Sasuke there, and Hanada was next to him, but she was down. He grit his teeth and cried out again. I'm coming. But the moment of fear and hesitation spelled the end for Sasuke. A flood of Sanban poured from behind him, and before he had turned halfway to deflect them it was too late. Sasuke staggered back, blinking down at himself. Needles protruded from everywhere, impaling him in several dozen places, some of which looked vital. He turned slowly towards Naruto, their eyes meeting for a moment. Naruto caught a glimpse of crimson irises inlaid with a single black tomo. And then Sasuke was falling. Naruto broke through the circle just as his friend hit the ground. Sasu. Naruto stopped in his tracks. Sasuke had fallen, 
bleeding and riddled with Sanban, right next to Hanada. They both lay very still, their faces pale as death itself. Sasuke. Naruto rasped, falling to his knees. Hanada. Chan. Tears were streaming down his face before he had time to register their coming. His two friends were in front of him, and they were dead. His best friends, the first two to ever recognize him. He would never get the chance to help Sasuke fulfill his dream. He would never be able to confess to Hinata how he felt, even if he didn't know how to put it into words yet. Pain unlike any he had ever experienced coursed through him, agony so deep it made his bones ache. This can't be happening. It isn't. This is the world you live in, ninja. Haku's voice echoed eerily through the otherwise silent chamber. He was taking the moment to breathe and recover some. With only one left, there was no chance he would lose. We try to protect those we care about, but my desire was stronger this time. I'm sorry. Though his voice was hollow, he did sound sincere. No amount of sincerity mattered to Naruto, however. You. Naruto snarled, the words coming out grated and distorted somehow. The ground had begun to shake and the air within the ring of mirrors started heating up and thickening. You killed them, he ground out through a clenched jaw, gums starting to bleed as human teeth elongated and sharpened into fangs. I'll kill you. Clawed fingers dug into the stone, gouging out rifts in the bridge beneath him. Naruto lifted his head slowly, his face shadowed until it was fully raised to the nearest mirror, blood-red eyes seeming to look into every one of Haku's reflections at the same time, murderous intent dancing in both snake-like slits. I'll kill you. The otherworldly roar shook the entire bridge, interrupting the fight between Zabuza and Kakashi and forcing all heads to turn towards the circle of ice mirrors. A column of red-orange chakra erupted from where Naruto had been standing, consuming him in the malevolent haze. The energy burned a hole straight through the topmost mirror, shattering it to pieces moments later. Rivulets of chaotic chakra circled around him, cutting protective swaths around the bodies of his fallen friends. The blast of power forced Zabuza to stumble back, and Kakashi had to brace himself to only slide back a few inches. This chakra, the Kyubi, Naruto. Zabuza tisked and rushed in while Kakashi was distracted, forcing him back with a muttered curse. Inside of Haku's technique, the swirl of energy diminished slowly, settling to form a writhing ring of red around the now-crouched Naruto. He looked much as he had years before in the forest with Mizuki, feral and mad with bloodlust. This time, however, the cloak of evil chakra stayed, coating him completely. A tail-like protrusion stuck out from near his tailbone, whipping back and forth restlessly as if it had a mind of its own. But it was the eyes that made Haku take a step back into his mirror. Those scarlet orbs of malice, wrought with the purest hate. They stared into Haku, and they could see him. I have to finish this now, Haku nearly panicked, trying to shake the paralyzing fear away. But Naruto had already charged, and it was faster than anything he had ever witnessed. The mirror exploded into a thousand shards as a clawed fist crashed through it with enough force to level a mountain. The three adjacent mirrors all cracked and fell to pieces moments after, the shockwaves from the blow enough to do them in. Haku had retreated instantly to another mirror, and Naruto's eyes followed him. Almost as he entered the next panel Naruto was there, another fist raised to do the same damage as before. Haku was forced to jump again, but that was exactly what the crazed genin had wanted. Bones cracked as Naruto's hand closed on Haku's ankle, catching him before he was able to get a meter past the mirror. Impossible, he thought blankly, that's not possible. Despite his disbelief, the next moment Haku slammed into the ground with another crunch of bone. The Anbu mask cracked down the middle as his head hit the stone, halves falling away to reveal his still untouched face. His leg jerked again and he found himself speeding through the so fast that the air was forced from his lungs. An explosion of agony ripped through him as he was made into a living projectile, smashing through another of his mirrors like it had been made of brittle glass. Haku's limp, battered body hit the ground and tumbled over and over, rolling to a halt a few meters away from Kakashi. The broken boy struggled to get up using what must have been a broken arm, making small groaning noises with each movement. Kakashi noted that the lower portion of one leg had been crushed, and the rest of the boy looked almost as badly beaten. Only then did he see his student walking towards them, 
still wreathed in a torrent of the Kayubi's chakra, projecting a killing intent so pure, so instinctual that it sent a shiver down his spine. The hate was literally palpable, it thickened the air around Naruto, choking those nearby like too much heat in a closed sauna. The boy's eyes were fixed on Haku, his face contorted into a snarl, lips peeled back to bare his fang teeth at his helpless adversary. Zabuza moved in front of Haku, stone-faced with his sword drawn. A half-dozen water clones appeared around Naruto a breath later, all charging and attacking at the same time. They might as well have been gnats. A wave of raw force screamed outward, colliding with the clones and dispersing them into clouds of steam. He kept advancing slowly, ignoring Zabuza as if he wasn't standing between Naruto and his quarry. Back off, the Junin growled, readying his sword to defend Haku. Naruto's gaze snapped up to his for a fraction of a second, and for that moment he knew true fear. Zabuza blinked down at his chest and bloodied hand, his vision abruptly very blurry. It took a few long seconds to notice that a forearm was protruding from where his sternum should have been. He followed it back to a shoulder swathed in heavy black cloth and red light, and finally landed on a familiar face. Naruto stood in front of him, his arm raised through Zabuza's chest. The boy growled, the noise guttural and sounding like it had come from a large and terrifying animal. With a jerk of his arm he flung Zabuza to the side like a ragdoll, the still-confused man falling onto his back a few meters away. Naruto reached down with deliberate slowness, grasping Haku's collar and lifting him effortlessly into the air to dangle helplessly. Despite being ravaged and hardly alive, Haku met his opponent's gaze without flinching and managed a tired smile. A growl escaped Naruto's throat again and he raised a fist, preparing to finish what he had started. He didn't hesitate, but a foreign pressure kept his arm from moving. Naruto, Kakashi said quietly from beside him, hand braced against his student's bicep in a vain attempt to hold back the blow. It was like trying to stop an avalanche, but he held on and ground out his words. Naruto, come to your senses. You don't want to kill him, it isn't you. He grunted, sliding back a few centimeters from the pressure. His hand was beginning to burn inside of the foreign chakra. There were tendrils of smoke rising from his fingernails and the metal guard on the back of his hand had begun to blacken. N Naruto. The choking gasp caused Naruto to freeze suddenly, the tension against Kakashi halting. He turned his head slowly, eyes traveling back to where the shattered remains of Haku's jutsu lay. Sasuke was kneeling there, supporting Hinata on his shoulder and breathing heavily. But he was alive. Hanada's chest rose and fell sharply in shallow breaths, but she too lived, if barely. As immediately as it had come, the raging power vanished. Haku tumbled to the ground again as Naruto released his hold and sprinted towards his friends, eyes already returning to their normal blue. Kakashi was left to stare after him, forgetting himself for a time before he straightened and went quickly to check on Zabuza. That kid, the fallen ninja rasped, voice already weak. He ah, uh, surprised me I, I guess. He grunted, more blood spattering the bandages over his mouth. Hataki Kakashi. He started again, tone heavy with weariness and growing quieter. Haku. He's not like, he's not like me. Zabaza's voice grew urgent, as if he knew that only seconds remained to get out his last words. He's kind. Doesn't deserve this. He coughed again sending his body into violent convulsions for several seconds. When he recovered his eyes had glazed over and his voice had become thready. P please. Let him. Let him. Live. A faint noise escaped the man's lips as he exhaled his last breath, a sound that might have been a satisfied sigh. Kakashi knelt next to the fallen ninja, running his hand over the man's eyes and closing them permanently. I'll honor your last request, demon of the hidden mist. He rose then glancing towards Tazuna to make sure he was all right before rushing to his team. Naruto had them both laying on their backs now, the numerous Sanban that would have hindered such a position discarded to the side. He had Hinata's head in his lap and was speaking softly to Sasuke, who seemed conscious despite the obvious pain he was in. I'm telling you he missed on purpose, Sasuke said hoarsely, grunting in discomfort. He could have easily killed us both, but I think he put us in a near-death state, like he did for Zabuza. He was trying to complete his mission without killing us. Naruto breathed, fresh tears welling up at the corners of his eyes. 
As Kakashi approached he couldn't help but notice that the boy looked normal. As if he hadn't just unleashed an incredible torrent of energy and punched a hole through a man's chest. Where is he now? Both Sasuke and Kakashi blinked. Naruto looked from one to the other, then asked defensively, what? Naruto. Kakashi said quietly, looking down at his student with hard eyes. Look at your right hand. Still holding on to a quizzical expression Naruto looked down. It was his turn to blink. From mid-bicep to his fingertips, his arm had a solid coat of fresh blood. He began trembling uncontrollably and had to set Hinata's head down, standing too quickly and stepping back. No way. He breathed, face turning white. That wasn't real. It didn't really happen. I didn't. I didn't kill anybody. Naruto looked towards Kakashi, then to Sasuke, then back again, breathing quickening. I didn't. I couldn't. I. I. His stomach heaved and he lurched to the side. Kakashi was next to him in a heartbeat, steadying him and speaking as gently as he could. Naruto. Calm down. Take deep breaths. It seemed like a struggle, but after a time his breathing slowed and came back towards control again. You are a ninja of Kanahagakur. Sometimes you must kill to save your comrades' lives and complete missions. This is not the time to dwell on it. We need to get Sasuke and Hinata somewhere safe. And Haku, it seems. Right. Somewhere safe. Naruto seemed dazed but compliant, following Kakashi back to the others to begin to help transport them elsewhere. His thoughts dulled and he moved mechanically. He was aware of Tazuna and Kakashi around him, of the makeshift stretchers they made. But everything seemed distant, and it remained as such for a long, long time. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. The sound of waves striking the shore was a familiar one. It was late, very late, and the others were asleep inside. It had taken most of the day to get the three wounded stable. After multiple donations of blood, supplied mostly by himself, Kakashi, and Tazuna, his friends had finally gotten through the life-threatening blood loss. Haku had undergone multiple surgeries and now lay encased in casts and bandages, all from two blows, or so he had been told. Bits and pieces, Naruto said again dully, staring off into the darkness instead of at Kakashi. They had been over what happened countless times and he still couldn't remember most of it. I saw Sasuke fall down, I remember his Sharingan, for sure, and then I saw them both. They were, his voice broke, and for the umpteenth time since the encounter he had to hold back tears. They were dead, from there it's choppy, I remember going for Haku, I think I remember throwing him. Next thing I knew I was holding him up ready to, no, wanting to kill him. I wanted it more than anything in the world. He clutched at his stomach, doubling over and trying not to vomit into the water. The Kyubi's chakra, Kakashi sighed, leaning back against the side of the house. The seal is loosening, it seems, and you can tap into its energy when your emotions run wild. That's what happened last time, isn't it? Naruto nodded, expressionless. Naruto I'll say it again, and as many times as I need to until you understand, it wasn't you. It may have looked like you, felt like you, used your voice to talk, but the Naruto I know doesn't enjoy inflicting pain or killing. I know you wouldn't have if you'd been in control. But I should be in control, Naruto snapped, snarling at nothing. It's my body, I should be in control, not the damn fox. Then work to control it, I guess, Kakashi shrugged. That finally earned him a look and a few blinks from Naruto. He was about to ask how when Kakashi held up his hands. I don't know how, Naruto. But if there's a way, I know you'll find it. The boy looked away again, saying nothing. I'm going to get some sleep. We still have a mission to complete, and we'll need to guard Tazuna again tomorrow. He stood then, moving towards the door where he stopped, glancing back at Naruto. They're probably waiting for you upstairs, I think they're worried about you, despite their own conditions. With that he was gone, slipping silently into the house. The evening stretched on as Naruto sat in silence on the dock, thinking on everything over and over as he had done all day. He had killed somebody today. Not from afar with a kanai or even with a jutsu. He had slain them intimately, mercilessly, like it had been part of his daily routine. The thought made him sick. Maybe Kakashi was right, that it had been necessary and the right course of action. 
Maybe that was true. It didn't make it any easier to bear. And the Kyubi had taken control of him yet again. He choked back another sob. This one bitter and fueled by anger. Kakashi's right. I need to control it. Somehow. All at once exhaustion hit him. Every muscle felt tight and sore, every bone ached to the core. He rose slowly, swaying on his feet due to a mixture of nausea, dizziness, and fatigue. It felt like a terribly long journey to get through the door and up the stairs. Slipping into the room Sasuke and Hinata were sharing for recovery proved no less difficult, but in a moment he was standing quietly nearby, looking down at them both. In that moment he realized what Kakashi had been trying to tell him days earlier. More than anything else that had happened that day, more than killing Zabuza or even the Kyubi, what hurt most was to see his friends' lives threatened. The memory of their still forms rose unbidden and he couldn't help it, he cried. Silent tears shook him for a long while. He finally found his way to his bedroll, placed between the two so that he could be close at hand if either needed him. Silent tears continued to fall as sleep finally took him. Through his weeping he didn't even notice the small, gentle hand placed upon his arm just before he drifted off. A firmer, yet just as comforting hand rested on his shoulder, helping to guide him towards the peace of sleep. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Morning sunlight warmed the makeshift bedroom gradually, the soft glow finally reaching Naruto's face and making him blink his eyes open slowly. He didn't move for a while, trying to figure out what the pressures on his limbs were. He lifted his head to look, blinking away unbidden tears as he spotted Hinata's hand resting lightly on his left arm, Sasuke's on his opposite shoulder. They were breathing deeply, likely still fast asleep after their trials the day before. Naruto carefully moved each of their hands, placing them gently back to rest on their stomachs. Only, Hinata didn't let go once he took her hand. He smiled faintly, propping himself up against the wall with a few pillows and closing his eyes, Hinata's hand held in his lap between his own. He stayed like that for over an hour, thinking and meditating. It took him a long time to work up to it, but he finally opened his eyes again. Instead of the room he was sitting in, however, he was staring up at the Kyubi's seal. The giant gate was there, still locked with the paper seal at its center. No cracks or noticeable weaknesses had appeared. Naruto frowned, looking hard into the darkness beyond the massive metal bars. Kayubi, he said finally, voice hard and loud. A low rumbling filled the air, accompanied by the sound of gargantuan claws scraping on a stone surface. Ah, mortal, to what do I owe the pleasure? The fox sneered, luminous eyes opening slowly. I enjoyed that little display of yours last night, though it's too bad you didn't get to finish the boy off. Shut up, Naruto said flatly. He had spent over an hour mentally preparing for this, and he wouldn't allow the demon to get the better of him. I came to talk. Come closer. He steeled himself then, waiting, as the eyes narrowed. Ripples played out from under the gate as the sounds of shifting weight filled the room, the scale of which was lost in the blackness beyond. A face slowly came into view, though rather than it moving towards Naruto the dull light of the room simply seemed to extend into the cage. The Kyubi was truly massive. Naruto could only see its face now, but even that was enough to send a spike of fear unbidden down his spine. Its head was roughly the size of the Hokage's tower, with orange fur coating it in every place there wasn't something menacing. For all intents and purposes it was a fox's face, but elongated and set in a permanent snarl with pointed ears that he could have mistaken for horns disappearing into the darkness behind. Fangs lined the Kyubi's mouth, each longer than a grown man and pearly white, gleaming dangerously in the dimness. Even when illuminated, its malevolent red eyes gave off a light of their own, flashing in the light. Satisfied, the demon asked mildly, voice still loud enough to rattle Naruto's ribcage. Good enough. Naruto had taken the sight in stride, trying his best to not show any of the fear that threatened to shake his will. I want to know how I can control your chakra, he asked bluntly, staring defiantly at the beast. I don't want to lose control again. The Kyubi stared at him, expressionless for a long moment, then barked out a harsh laugh that reverberated several times through the chamber. The action looked strange coming from such a creature, though no more so than its speaking. Control. You think you can control my power? Its tone was openly mocking, 
and the snarl suddenly looked like a sneer. No, he responded patiently, folding his arms. But I think you can help me control when and how it comes on instead of just letting it flow out like crazy when I get worked up. He waited for a moment, possibly for a sign from the demon, but none came. Look, you're the one who has the vested interest, or whatever in keeping me alive. If you showed me how to do that much I'm sure I'd be better off. Kid, you're a fool, the Kyubi growled, my chakra is already keeping you alive. Whenever you're in dire straits it comes out against my will, you can't tell me you'd have been better off against Mizuki without it, or against Haku. You're not wrong, Naruto agreed, sighing in the same breath and scratching at the back of his neck. But that's not how I want to use your chakra. Look couldn't we work together or something? You show me how to just use your chakra to help me, and you get a little more freedom out of it. If a giant fox demon could look suspicious, the Kyubi's expression was as close to it as possible. Freedom, right, the demon laughed, a hulking something thrashing into view for the briefest moment. You and I both know that I'm not getting out of here, so don't even think. Do you think I'm stupid enough to let you out? Naruto interrupted, a fairly impressive feat considering his voice was about a 60 decibels lower. No, but I can see if I can figure out how to change or even loosen the seal. I bet it gets real boring down here by yourself, maybe I'd let you hang out in my head or something. Well, outside, sort of, I mean consciously. You know what I mean, he finished, glowering at nothing. It was about a minute before the Kyubi responded, rumbling through a low chuckle first. You've got guts, kid, I'll give you that. Bright eyes flashed, in recognition, and then the Kyubi nodded. I'll think about it. Figure the seal issue out first. Your offer means little to me if you can't even follow through with it. All right, fair enough, Naruto agreed, turning to leave the chamber. Not that there was a door to leave by, but it was the principle of the action. By the way, it wouldn't kill you to be a little nicer. He smirked slightly, a bit of immature glee showing through at having the last word, before he dismissed the scene by concentrating hard. The last thing he heard was a low growl before he again opened his eyes, revealing the room as it had been before. Nothing had changed, and judging by the light coming through the window it seemed like his conversation with the Kyubi had only lasted a few seconds at most. Um, Naruto-kun. He blinked and looked down, his eyes falling on Hinata's still slumbering form. She was muttering softly to herself, likely a result of a dream. We're not supposed to go outside yet. She trailed off, making cute sleepy noises for a time before resettling, pulling Naruto's hand to her and snuggling with it. Even though he knew she couldn't see him, and that she had no idea what she was doing, Naruto still blushed furiously. He let her keep his hand though, waiting patiently for her to rouse and give it back. A few minutes later Hinata blinked her eyes open slowly, wincing slightly as she shifted under the bedroll. Something warm was pressed against her cheek, and for a second she thought it was her own hand until she identified its source. The poor girl froze, eyes widening as they focused on Naruto's profile above her, color flooded to her cheeks. Morning, Hinata-chan. Naruto said gently with a sheepish grin, I hope you slept well. Judging by the intense amount of heat now radiating from her cheek, he suspected she had mostly recovered overnight. And Naruto-kun, she stuttered, sitting up quickly and releasing his hand in a moment of panic. A wash of dizziness hit her and she wavered, teetering away before Naruto caught her. A moment later her head was down again, propped up a little with an extra pillow. His hand was in hers again, though she didn't remember how it got there. Hey, don't try to sit up yet, you lost a lot of blood, remember? She nodded carefully, wincing and closing her eyes for a moment as the flush began to fade away. What happened after I, after I went unconscious yesterday? She asked hesitantly, eyes still closed. Naruto tensed next to her and squeezed her hand tightly, causing her to blink her eyelids open and glance up at him. He was looking off towards the wall, his expression unreadable. Naruto-kun, what? Hanada trailed as he grimaced. I'll tell you soon, he said gruffly, glancing down at their still sleeping companion. I want Sasuke to be awake first, I owe you both an explanation. Kinda hard to sleep with you two yapping like that, Sasuke mumbled, keeping his eyes closed. 
You're supposed to let injured people sleep, jerk. Naruto couldn't help but grin as his friend carefully sat up, slow enough to not cause the spell of dizziness Hinata had experienced. Naruto helped him set a few pillows against the wall and get comfortable before he leaned back again, his features becoming a bit strained. Sorry, but, I have something I need to tell you both. Hinata bit her lip but nodded, squeezing his hand gently. Sasuke nodded, choosing to stare at the far wall. And so Naruto told them everything, from the very beginning. It was hard, and his voice started out tight and a bit husky. But soon his tone turned tired, calmer, as if the act of sharing the story somehow offered relief. He told them about Mizuki, how he had learned from the man what lived inside of him, the reason the village despised him. He told his friends about the times he had been possessed by the malevolent chakra, how it felt, and the bits he could remember from it. He told them about his three encounters with the Kyubi thus far, in the recesses of his own mind. And then he told them what happened at the bridge after they had both fallen into a near-death state. Most of it was put together in bits and pieces, from what Kakashi had told him about Haku's wounds and the flashes he could remember. He told them about how he had killed Zabuza without batting an eyelash, and about how he had intended to murder Haku, and would have if Sasuke hadn't called to him. By the time he had finished he was looking down at his lap, his words getting thick and a little choked near the end. Back then, I didn't tell you because I thought you might look at me differently, that maybe you'd treat me different too. I didn't choose to be like this, and I didn't mean to let that power loose or kill anybody. Tears welled up as he came to his conclusion but he held them back, swallowing once or twice. But you two are my best friends, you deserve to know about me, about how dangerous I can be. It wasn't fair to keep it a secret. He sat there then, silent, staring at the one hand still in his lap before he realized that his other was being virtually crushed between both of Hanada's. His friends had been silent through the whole explanation, hanging on every word in their own way. Sasuke still stared blankly at the far wall. Anyo. Naruto-kun. Hanada began finally, looking up at him intently. Mizuki said, and you've said, too, that the Kyubi is sealed inside of you, right? That the Yandaimi did it. Naruto nodded, averting his gaze from her. Then you should know that what Mizuki told you, what the villagers think of you, is wrong. The fervor with which she spoke caused both of the boys to blink at her, surprised at the passion that she had expressed in her statement. Hanada let out a small squeak and looked down again, flushing and speaking quieter again. I I mean, you're not a demon. You're his keeper, in a way, right? Man you can be thick sometimes, Sasuke sighed, stretching with only a slight wince. You think just because you've got a demon fox prisoner inside you that it makes you a bad person or something? He smirked and shook his head, punching Naruto's arm weakly. You're the most optimistic, annoyingly cheery person I know. You've got a better chance of making the Kyubi into a pet kitten than he has of making you into a demon puppet. We both know you wouldn't kill unless you absolutely had to, Hanada began again with another hand squeeze. You're you, and no one else. We're not going anywhere, so we'll be here to remind you. She smiled then, a rare display of confidence, devotion, and warmth from the otherwise timid girl. Naruto found himself infected by it, warmed and soothed by her words. He nodded, not trusting himself to speak. They sat like that for a time taking in the comfort of one another's company. Kakashi popped in a while later to check on them, ignoring their protests and insisting they all rest for the day, he would escort Tazuna himself. They spent the remainder of the day relaxing, talking, laughing, and living. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. The next few days passed by quickly. Hanada and Sasuke were back on their feet on their first morning awake, but Kakashi, and Naruto, for that matter, wouldn't let them leave the house for another full day. They sulked a bit, but complied after Naruto reminded them how they had both insisted he recover fully a few days before. They left Wave Country after the bridge's completion a few days later, sent off by quite the crowd. It seemed Inari and Tsunami had gone around the town and rallied the villagers against Gato, together ousting his gangs and thugs. Rumor had it that they had even cornered Gato himself and run him off a bridge, but nobody would confirm the truth in it. Somebody, Inari and Tazuna, Naruto expected, 
had led the citizens to believe that Team 7 had been heroes, and they had decided to name the new causeway, Bridge 7, in their honor. It was afternoon of their second day traveling, and the walls of Konoha loomed in the distance. Kakashi led the way, his three genin following behind. They had kept a purposefully slow pace, partly to continue recovery and partly due to not having a scheduled return date. Leave it to Kakashi to take the lazy route. Naruto walked between his friends, silent for a time. Conversation had kept up through most of the trip, though they had all fallen silent as their village came into view. Silently he reached down and took Hinata's hand, still looking towards the high walls. He smirked and extended his other hand towards Sasuke, who glanced at it, rolled his eyes, and slapped his palm into contact with Naruto's. They walked like that, hand in hand, all with their own unique expression of relief and joy. Kakashi glanced back at them furtively, smiling to himself beneath his mask before turning his attention forward once again. They had grown in the last two weeks, more than he could have hoped. The mission had brought them closer as friends, honed their skills even further, built confidence and trust, and many other things. It had also caused heartbreak, tragedy, and pain, but they had taken those and worked through them together, as a team. If this keeps up, people might start thinking I'm not lazy and might be a good mentor after all. Can't have that, he joked to himself, glancing to his left and raising an eyebrow. You sure you want to come back with us? I told you I wouldn't put you in my report to the Hokage. You'll be subjected to interrogation and possible imprisonment. I'm sure, Haku said softly, limping along every other step with the assistance of his crutches. Zabuza-san is dead and I owe Naruto-kun my life. If I offer your village my services as a ninja, perhaps I can be useful again. He was quiet then, glancing to the trio behind with a sad smile. In that instant he looked young, like the boy he was, not the tool for assassination he had been trained as. I'll do what I can to help you, I promised Zabuza I would. That wasn't entirely true, but Zabuza had been right about Haku. The boy was kind to a fault deeply empathetic and innocent. It was a shame he had been mistreated for most of his life, even if he hadn't seen it that way. Haku nodded and said nothing more, continuing slowly towards Konoha and an unknown fate. Chapter 8. Friendship. That has to be considered cheating, Naruto laughed, accepting Sasuke's offered hand and rising from the ground. It was the third time during their sparring match that he'd been knocked down, something he was far from used to. Since they had returned from Wave Country Sasuke had been able to beat him consistently. Hey, I can't help it if my Sharingan gives me an advantage. Besides, I can hardly keep up with you without it. Sasuke was grinning. He had been expressing more emotion lately, ever since his bloodline had activated at the bridge. His red eyes shimmered in the early morning sunlight as he settled into a ready stance again. Naruto rolled his eyes, though he was still smiling. It was nice to see his friend's mood elevated again, it had been too long. Yeah yeah, I know. It's good practice anyway. Naruto resettled into his own stance, expression smoothing to one of calm and focus. For a moment they merely stood there, working out each other's defenses. Sasuke was the first to move, a blur of motion that his adversary had trouble keeping up with. For a full minute they traded blows, striking faster with every passing second until their sole onlooker had trouble keeping up. But Hinata still held the title of fastest when it came to their little group, and she had only to narrow her eyes and concentrate to keep track of their movements. Thirty seconds later Sasuke and Naruto stood panting in front of one another, each with a smirk on his face. Sasuke's right fist was settled directly in front of his friend's nose, while Naruto's hand was open in a Y strike an equal distance from the Uchiha's throat. It had been a tie. Man, I thought I had you, Naruto sighed, lowering his hand as Sasuke did the same. It's like you can see what I'm about to do before I do it. I still don't get how that works. Sasuke shrugged, stepping back and stretching upwards. I told you. It just lets me see things better, more clearly. For example, I know what you're saying just by looking at your mouth moving. Naruto blinked, then mouthed something at his friend. Very funny, Sasuke said dryly, though it made the blonde boy grin. I don't think I've gotten stronger, technically, but my reflexes are quicker because I can see subtle movements clearer. 
Get it. Naruto thought about that for a second and nodded slowly. All right. That makes more sense. That's really cool. Sasuke shrugged. But uh, why is there one Tomo in your left eye, but two in your right? You said three was the most, right? Yeah, three is the most, and I think my right eye can see more than my left. As if to test it, he closed one eye at a time, glancing around with each before turning back to Naruto and blinking both open. I can't tell much a difference just standing around, but things do look a little sharper with my right eye. I know the Sharingan has a lot of abilities, some that a lot of people don't know about. Like what? Hanada asked as they approached and took a seat in the grass on either side of her. Naruto sat with his legs out, propped up by his hands, one of which rested a few centimeters from her own. A bit of heat rose in her chest and she tried to ignore it. Well, I heard when I was younger that a fully matured Sharingan can put someone into a kind of hypnosis. It's not mind control so much as it is suggestion. His friends turned to stare at him at that mention, and he shrugged again. But both eyes have to have three Tomo, I think. I can already memorize hand signs I know. I can see chakra kind of like how Hanada can, and I can even copy some techniques like Kakashi. There are some advanced uses that combine a few abilities of the Sharingan at once, but I'm nowhere near there yet. Naruto sighed and fell back, lacing his fingers behind his head as he reclined in the grass. Still, that's so cool. You two have such neat dujutsu. Hanada turned a little pink at the comment, though couldn't keep the bit of worry from her eyes. She had been concerned lately that Naruto might get down on himself for not having a bloodline ability like she or Sasuke did. He seemed to take training even more seriously than normal since Sasuke had begun beating him in sparring more often. Hey, guess that means I have to train harder to keep up with you too. Naruto's broad grin made her feel foolish for even thinking that he might be discouraged. He never gave up. Your turn, Hanada, Sasuke said with a spurious grimace. If I'm going to fully utilize my new eyes I'll need you to help me increase my speed. Maybe I'll be able to land more than one hit this time. He pushed himself back up and strode back out into center of the small clearing, turning to face Hanada. She smiled a little, turning a bit pink at his veiled compliment before rising smoothly and pacing forward. The veins in around her eyes stretched and stood out against her skin as she activated the Byakugan. Naruto sat back up to observe, watching intently as they readied themselves and began. Hanada was fast. Her strikes didn't carry nearly the same power that her friends did, but they came like lightning and were just as dangerous in their own right. Even with Sasuke's heightened reflexes and perception he couldn't counter every hit, though it was close. Several times he came close to striking his own blows but was met with either air or a deft block. The hardest part about sparring with Hinata was that he simply couldn't block her attacks for fear of one of his tenkatsu being closed in the process. They had both encouraged her to use Jukin against them in order to get a feel for the style, and she had improved over the years. A few minutes later Sasuke dropped to one knee, clutching his shoulder and wincing. Well, I did get you twice, he panted, grinning despite the fact that he had clearly lost. You mind healing a little? I think you bruised my collarbone and one of my ribs. Hanada winced and nodded. They always told her not to feel bad for injuring them. Her fighting style required her to force chakra into her opponent's body in order to affect their tenkatsu. She was able to target points near organs to damage them as well, but even when she sparred using Jukin Hanada did her best to avoid any areas that would cause lasting harm. I'm gonna need to do something to keep up with you too, Naruto sighed, approaching to watch as Hanada placed her hands over the areas she had damaged. A soft green glow pulsed from her palms, seeming to flow into under Sasuke's clothes to seam into his skin. In moments she was finished, stepping back with an apologetic duck of her head. Naruto grinned again. You really are awesome, Hanada-chan. Her lips parted as if she was about to say something in response, but instead she just turned a vibrant shade of red and kept looking down, fidgeting with the hem of her coat. All right you two, Sasuke groaned as he stood back up rotating his shoulder to make sure it was fully functional. I'm going to go clean up before we have to meet Kakashi-sensei. I'll see you at nine. He waved absently and turned, the scarlet of his irises fading back to their usual black. Naruto stood looking after him for a moment, 
seemingly lost in thought until Hanada's voice brought him back. Anyo. Naruto-kun. She asked hesitantly, cheeks still fairly pink. Do you really think I'm awesome? Naruto blinked at her, tilting his head to the side and looking a little confused. It had taken a measure of self-control not to laugh. Hearing Hanada say, awesome, was foreign enough to at least earn a chuckle. He resisted. Though, Uruka, and Kakashi now, though on much rarer occasions, always told him to think carefully in conversation. Uruka had made it a point to discuss Hanada, too. Yeah, I do, he responded slowly a moment later, rubbing at the back of his neck. I think it's incredible that you're so fast, and you know some really impressive techniques too. Not only that but you picked up that healing jutsu so well. And, well, Hanada blinked, the blush creeping over her features momentarily halting. Naruto was embarrassed. The boy had averted his gaze and was shifting his weight subconsciously, as if uncomfortable all of a sudden. And you're always thinking about us instead of yourself, you're a really nice person. By the time he had finished speaking her flush had returned in full force. A ripe cherry would have been jealous of Hanada's complexion. I I. She hadn't planned much further than asking his opinion. It wasn't that she doubted Naruto's word, she trusted him implicitly. The facts simply didn't add up. The way she saw herself and the way he saw her were just too different. If he was being honest, he just doesn't really know me. But that didn't make sense either. Apart from being friends for half of a decade, she had been living with him and Aruka for nearly six months now. They were almost like siblings at home, she often told herself, so it wasn't like Naruto hadn't been around her a lot. If anybody outside of her family knew her, it would be Naruto. Er, Hanada-chan, he asked, waving a hand in front of her eyes cautiously. Are you okay? I didn't say something wrong, did I? And no, I'm fine. She stuttered, cursing herself for doing so a breath later. I'm sorry, just, thank you, Naruto-kun. Her expression didn't quite match her words. Rather than getting flustered and awkward Hinata seemed even more reserved than usual, bordering on somber. He's probably just trying to be nice. That was an explanation she could accept. Uh, sure, you don't have anything to be sorry for. Though, he insisted, sure now he'd done something to upset his friend. Hanada smiled weakly and shook her head. He frowned, but didn't say anything else for fear of making it worse. They made their way back home in an uncomfortable silence, Naruto awkward and worried while Hanada lost herself in thought. He glanced over at her several times on the way back, though she didn't seem to take notice. Hey, he said finally as Aruka's apartment came into view. She looked towards him and he flushed slightly, reaching his hand out before he lost the nerve. His fingers closed around her hand and he squeezed gently. I wasn't trying to hurt your feelings, I was just being honest. You're a good person, and I just wanted you to know that I know. Or, something like that, he laughed and rubbed at the back of his neck, an action she was now able to recognize as one of embarrassment. Hanada stopped. She stood staring at him from a step behind, her hand hanging forward still attached to his. He had taken an extra step and was looking back, more concern rising in his features. Her own expression started as blank, evolving into one of disbelief, until she finally bit her trembling lip and nodded slowly. Naruto nearly apologized for his awkward apology, but then she smiled, it was a real one this time. It may have been small, but it had the effect her smiles always did, he instantly felt warmer inside. Thank you, Naruto-kun, she said after a few seconds, returning a tentative squeeze of her own. This time the words were sincere, and Naruto grinned back. A very small but very real light flickered to life deep inside of her. Dark thoughts of doubt and inadequacy rushed to smother it, threatening the budding spark before it even had a chance to grow. But it held, steadfast and patient, burning away every plaguing apprehension and insecurity that came near. Naruto tugged lightly and got her moving again, and they went up together. He might never realize what he had done, but she did, and would never forget it. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Uruka sensei, we're heading out, Naruto called into the kitchen as he reached for the door. Do you need us to get anything on the way home today? The sound of tableware being set down preceded Uruka's head popping around the corner. 
No I think we're set for another day or two, thank you, though. Where do I need to meet you again? Yakaniku Q. We never got to celebrate our mission's success, and we get to treat. Naruto bubbled with excitement at the notion of treating somebody else to a nice meal. Upon their return to Konoha and Kakashi's mission report, the Sandame had upgraded the mission to B rank and made up the difference using the village's own coffers. Not only that, but Kakashi had claimed the bounties on Zabuza and the Demon Brothers from the Hidden Mist. He had initially split it evenly among Team 7, though after their insistence he had taken a larger share. Still, the Ryo each of the genin had received was considerable. This was especially true for Naruto, who had been living on a meager stipend until Uruka had taken him in. All right, all right, Uruka sighed, though he was smiling as he disappeared back into the kitchen. I'll see you there at six. The sounds of running water and clattering dishes started up again. Naruto glanced back at Hinata, who had been waiting just behind him. He gave her one of his signature grins, prompting a light blush but a small smile of her own, before reaching for the door. It took them only a few minutes to arrive at their meeting place, a wooden bridge on the west side of the village. Sasuke was already there, leaning against the railing and looking pensive, and even a little surly. As his friends approached he glanced aside, nodding at them before returning his gaze to the water. What's wrong, Sasuke? Hanada asked as they joined him, worry already creasing her brow. He glanced at her with a wry smirk and shook his head. She could always tell when something was amiss. I was just thinking about Haku. It's been a week since we got back and he hasn't been released yet. Naruto scowled at the water, and after a glance at him Hanada's worried expression softened. Naruto-kun, we know Haku let us live on purpose. And Kakashi-sensei thinks he's a nice person. Naruto shrugged at her words, but his expression softened a little. She didn't like seeing him upset, but they had discussed it several times since returning to Konoha. Naruto had even agreed that Haku had been acting as justly as he could have given the situation. I know, he sighed, running a hand through his spiky yellow hair, it bounced back into place the moment his hand passed over. It's just, it's still hard to consider him a good guy after that. And I sorta, well I almost killed him, too. They were all silent at that. Hanada and Sasuke had been in a near-death state then, but from what Naruto had reported, and Haku's injuries, they knew it wasn't an exaggeration. I would have done the same in your position, Sasuke said quietly, not looking away from the stream. Naruto glanced at him and considered for a moment, then nodded slowly. They stood staring at the rippling waters for a time, a comfortable silence broken only by the gentle sounds of the river below. Yo, sorry I'm late, Kakashi said from behind them a few minutes later, I was on my way here when. When an old lady needed help crossing the entire town, Naruto suggested, turning on the Junin with a smirk. When you had to save some children from a rock slide, Sasuke offered, giving Kakashi a level look. When the Hokage needed you for an urgent meeting, Hanada put in, though she flushed and looked down immediately. Kakashi blinked at them, then spread his hands in a placating manner. All right, all right, you win. He seemed to be grinning behind the mask. Ready for more missions today. Actually, Naruto began, earning him a glance from all parties. I was wondering if you learned anything else about Haku recently. Sasuke looked back to their teacher though not before offering his friend an appreciative glance. Hanada, too, turned to Kakashi expectantly. The man looked at them all before sighing, leaning back against the opposite railing and folding his arms. They finished interrogating and extracting information from him two days ago. Since then he's been awaiting judgment from the higher-ups, but the order just came down this morning. Haku is going to be executed at midnight. Kakashi's tone was flat as he delivered the news, betraying no emotion on what few features could be seen. Executed. Sasuke blurted out, genuine disbelief written all over his face. That's ridiculous. He could easily have killed Hinata and I, but he let us live on purpose. He is a dangerous ninja who, despite that fact, was working with a strong missing nin of the Hidden Mist. He may not have killed you, but he's killed others. He looked seriously at each of them in turn, noting their distraught, and in Sasuke's case, outright angry, expressions. I did what I could in his defense, but the word of one Junin isn't enough. 
I know it doesn't seem fair to you, but that's how things have to be sometimes. No they don't, Naruto said with no small amount of conviction. Haku may not be an ally yet, but he's not a bad person. He did those things because he cared about Zabuza. It may have been wrong, but he would have done anything Zabuza asked because he was the only one that recognized Haku. Kakashi could feel the passion in the boy's voice, and realized halfway through that Naruto was speaking from experience. He just made the wrong friend, he concluded after a moment's pause, looking to the side at Sasuke and Hinata. I'm sure if he made real friends he'd be fine, right? Definitely, Sasuke insisted, staring hard at Kakashi. At some point his Sharingan had activated, the crimson in his eyes making the look that much more intense. I think so, too, Hanada agreed meekly. While the girl seemed less fervent than her comrades she was no less committed. They all understood in their own way how Haku might feel. He was alone now, as they all had been at one time or another. They wanted him to be given another chance, a chance that everybody deserved. I don't disagree, Kakashi sighed, scratching at his neck distractedly. I just don't see what can be done for him, unless somebody was foolish enough to barge into the execution and defend him. But I can't think of anybody who would do something like that. He shrugged in mock helplessness, and then smiled approvingly as realization spread across his students' faces. The Hokage's tower, basement level. Take the stairs on the right as you enter the building, turn right when you get down there, and it's the last door on your left. But I didn't tell you so, he cautioned with a wave of his finger. They all nodded quickly, their expressions determined now. All right then, we're still doing a mission today, so let's get moving. Just one, Naruto asked as Kakashi turned towards town. Well I figured you three need a break today, he said calmly. I'm sure you can look after yourselves for an afternoon. Maybe train or, I don't know, come up with more formations and strategies. He shrugged and vanished in a plume of white smoke, though not before they noticed the exaggerated wink. They stood there for a moment, all looking at where Kakashi had disappeared from. Without a word they set off at the same time, as if of one mind, dashing towards the Hokage's tower to receive their mission. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. The mission was a simple one, even as D rank tasks went, they had been assigned to do an elderly couple's shopping. As usual, Kakashi set himself up in a tree, keeping his radio on for the unlikely event that they might need him. To get everything done as fast as possible, they each took a different part of the list and split up. Sasuke opted to gather the requested fabrics and clothing. Hinata chose to get groceries from the market, and Naruto went to pick up the various household supplies. As much as he had looked forward coming back to Konoha, Naruto hadn't been excited to be walking the streets of the village again. Most of his time was purposefully spent training, staying at home, or otherwise occupying himself away from the populace. Every venture into the heart of the village reminded him of the citizens' attitude towards him. An outraged, watch it, brat, or similar, Though generally less savory, remark was common, even when he was nowhere near the offended party. A handful of times he overheard the purposefully loud whisper of, Demon boy, or, Damned pariah. Naruto clenched his teeth and ignored them. The hit I ate on his forehead meant little to them, all they saw was what they wanted to see. It didn't matter that he was performing important duties for the village. By the time he had finished collecting the supplies Naruto's patience was running thin. On top of his mission and the people that seemed to purposefully get in his way, he was still concerned with Haku and how they were going to help him. Lost in thought, he didn't notice the foot extended from a nearby group of people until he was falling forward. He was forced to let the bags he had been holding fall to either side, catching himself just before hitting the ground and rebounding back up with a single downward thrust of his palms. Stealing now, are we? A sneering voice asked from behind him. I always knew you were a delinquent but I didn't think you were a criminal. Naruto turned to face the speaker, taking in measured breaths and keeping his expression neutral. The man was tall and gaunt, and was flanked by two burlier men of average height who carried just enough muscle to look threatening. I'm not stealing. I'm on a mission, Naruto responded coolly, retrieving his dropped bags one at a time. Doing some shopping for the village, huh? I guess they couldn't trust you with anything important not that you can blame them. 
The man laughed to himself, glancing over his shoulder to make sure his cronies had begun to chuckle as well. I heard you almost died on your mission to the wave country. You're lucky your Junin was there to save you. It's a pity. You must have missed the part where I killed a missing nin, Naruto shot back, a little harsher than he had intended. The three men blinked before the leader scoffed. Right, you killed a missing nin. What was he, an E-rank missing nin from the hidden village of pushovers? Again he turned to make sure his jibe had been, appreciated. Face it kid, you're an unwanted deadbeat. You probably only made Genin because the Hokages got a soft spot for you. This was going about as expected. The common tactic of, try to bait Naruto into a fight, was an old one, and in normal circumstances it wouldn't have phased him. Unfortunately this wasn't a normal circumstance. With the comments throughout his errands and Haku's impending execution on his mind, Naruto was worn thinner than usual. I know you're trying to get me to throw the first punch, Naruto responded after lifting the last bag into one hand, but it's not going to happen. Tell you what, how about you go first so that everybody else around can witness it, then report that I did it anyway. He had raised his voice loud enough to be heard by those nearby, several of them turning to watch the scene fully now. Most were glaring at Naruto as if he was the cause of the commotion, though the few that had cared to note his words looked back and forth between the boy and his aggressors as if unable to decide who was at fault. The tall thug dropped the fake smile he had been holding and glared openly. You'd like that, wouldn't you? He said quietly, making sure only Naruto heard. Trying to get some pity from the villagers. Good luck, because nobody gives a damn about you. He waited perhaps for an excuse to jump into action. Naruto merely met his gaze, the corner of his lip twitching upward in the smallest of smirks. The man sighed dramatically after a moment, turning to address his thugs but truly announcing to all those around. Guys, take those stolen goods back from the kids so that we can return them. The two flunkies nodded and grinned, stepping forward. Naruto stood fast as they approached, staying relaxed and looking as nonchalant as he could manage. He waited until just as they were reaching towards him before he made his move. His fingers unclenched, allowing the bags to fall towards the ground once more. What happened next wasn't particularly exciting to watch, largely because it happened too fast for most of the crowd to see. One moment Naruto was standing still, and the next he was also standing still. The two men, however, were on their backs, one clutching at his stomach while the other tried to simultaneously hold his right shin and left side. Both of their faces were twisted in pain, though neither seemed seriously injured. There were a few gasps from the onlookers, accompanied by rapid whispering. The remaining man's expression changed from overt smugness to outrage in the instant it had taken his lackeys to fall. With a strangled shout he charged forward, a curved knife appearing in his hand. Naruto didn't even blink. He went slower with this one, making sure those around them saw the knife being thrust towards his chest before he caught the man's wrist. The dagger fell from the attacker's hand as Naruto twisted his wrist and, using the bigger man's weight and momentum, pivoted and flung him hard. He landed with a satisfying thud several meters away, and the three men were left groaning or wheezing on the ground. Naruto once again calmly collected his bags. I'm sorry for the commotion, he said tersely bowing to the semi-circle of people gathered around him. I have a mission to complete, so if you'll excuse me. Uruka had taught him the basics of etiquette, and especially how to handle himself in situations like that. He would have a few choice words for Naruto if he learned of the encounter. Sasuke and Hinata were already waiting at the bench where they had agreed to rendezvous. Sasuke looked irritated, and Hinata seemed more fidgety than usual. What took you so long? Sasuke asked as Naruto approached, rising and looking his friend up and down. And why are you so dirty? Naruto shrugged noncommittally. He didn't want to talk about what had happened. Hanada watched him intently but said nothing. I had trouble finding a few things, and I fell once on my way here. Sasuke's eyes bored into his, as if they could simply tell he was lying through eye contact. You two couldn't have been here long anyway, Naruto continued, annoyed. Let's finish the mission so we can figure out what to do for Haku. That took Sasuke's attention away and he nodded, falling into place next to his friend. Hanada followed silently a step behind on Naruto's other side, 
effectively hiding her concern from view. It was just after noon when they delivered the supplies to the elderly couple at the edge of the village. After finding Kakashi they made their way to the Hokage's tower, entering the mission's office to give their report and receive a small amount of Ryo for the completed assignment. Uruka smiled at Naruto and his friends as they came in. The Sandame was rifling through papers at the desk, no doubt searching for the D-rank mission's list, when Kakashi coughed politely and spoke. Hokage-sama, I would like to give my team a break from missions this afternoon to go over some special training. Uruka looked up from his work and blinked at the request, glancing aside at the Hokage a moment later. The old man was studying Kakashi's impassive features, an almost unseen smile tugging at his lips before he nodded. Of course, Kakashi, it is important that your students are well prepared, after all. If he didn't know any better, Naruto would have sworn he had seen a twinkle in the Hokage's eye. Kakashi bowed and thanked him, and the three genin mimicked his gesture before departing. The Hokage knows, doesn't he? Sasuke asked quietly as they made their way down from the office. Hanada looked even more worried now, tugging one of her sleeves nervously. You never know with the Sandame, Kakashi said with a shrug, opening the front door to the tower and letting in a flood of sunlight. But I'm certain that he's the least of your worries right now. Remember what I told you. Or rather, what I didn't tell you. They all nodded, and he returned the action. Come on, we can use our place to talk. Uruka sensei won't be back for a few more hours anyway. Sasuke nodded and turned to set off towards his apartment to pick up what he would need for the evening. Naruto went to turn towards Uruka's but stopped, glancing back at Hinata who was still standing by the doorway. Kakashi had disappeared, presumably to go read one of his weird books, and they were now the only ones in the area. Hinata-chan. She bit her lower lip and glanced up at him, and now he could see the distress written all over her features. Why were you attacked, Naruto-kun? She asked hesitantly. He blinked at her before scowling down at the ground, shrugging after a moment. You saw, huh? The question was largely rhetorical, but she nodded. The same thing as usual, he sighed, giving her a wry smile. You've been living with Aruka sensei and me for a while now. You must have overheard us some time talking about the villagers. Naruto tilted his head towards Sasuke's retreating form, silently beckoning Hinata to follow as he took a slow step. She hurried next to him, still listening intently but staring at her feet now. Ever since I entered the academy they've been a little more upfront about their dot dot insults and assaults, I guess. Before that it was just whispers, and occasionally an accidental shove in front of a moving food cart. Her eyes snapped up to him, wide with unspoken horror and empathy. He shrugged and continued, and it hurt her more still that he could just take it in stride. Uruka sensei taught me to just ignore them, that if I let them get to me it'll only encourage them and make things worse. But those guys, he paused for a moment, searching for the right words. I don't know, honestly. They were trying to pick a fight, and instead of walking away I egged them on and made them attack first. It wasn't right, he admitted, a bit of guilt showing through in his expression, but they just got to me, I guess. Naruto stopped there, trying to ignore the people they passed. The hushed tones were less frequent and much quieter with Hinata next to him, but he could hear them all the same. And so could she. Naruto-kun. She began, faltering and glancing around as they walked. She wanted to tell him that he had been justified in his actions, that nobody should have to endure such a thing. And what's more, he had lived with it every day for his whole life. It hurt to watch as he pretended the comments didn't affect him, that he didn't notice the cold looks of too many strangers. When she walked the streets of Konoha on her own, she was met with the same common courtesy any other citizen might enjoy, some who recognized her as a Hyuga might even incline their heads respectfully. But Naruto, they might share the same roads, but when it came down to it they lived in vastly different villages. Naruto blinked as he felt a soft pressure close in around his fingers, looking down to find Hinata's hand curling around his own. She was blushing furiously, and kept glancing around as if embarrassed, but her features were set in quiet determination. Color rose in his cheeks as well and she looked away quickly. Every time they had come to hold hands it had been Naruto that had initiated the contact, even when it had been him that needed consoling. It was a friendly, 
comforting gesture that was becoming more familiar, but it felt so different when Hanada was the one reaching for him. Hanada didn't say anything on the walk back to their apartment, but she didn't need to. The stress from earlier had already started to melt away. Naruto didn't know how to put it into words, but it felt like she was trying to tell him something, like the action of taking his hand and holding on tightly was more than it seemed. He puzzled over it for a time before deciding it wasn't important. What was meaningful was that he felt better. Thanks, Hanada-chan, he said quietly, smiling sheepishly ahead. She ducked her head in a nod, not daring to look up. You always know how to cheer me up. If possible Hanada reddened further, shaking her head quickly. It's true, Naruto protested, though his grin faded as he glanced aside at a group casting furtive glances in their direction. But, we probably shouldn't hold hands in public. People might start associating you with me and. He trailed off as Hanada's head lifted sharply, her eyes fixing on his for a moment. In those brief seconds he saw strength of will and raw defiance unlike any he'd ever seen in his friend. She looked away again quickly, but her face was set in a determined stare. Good, she said quietly, though her tone was one of intense conviction. I'm okay with that, Naruto-kun. Naruto blinked at her, and then she blinked at herself. I I mean, she stammered, squeezing her eyes shut for a second. I mean associated like we are already, as friends. Hanada struggled with her words for a moment, then fell into a hopelessly embarrassed silence. Before she could stop herself she pulled her hand from Naruto's grasp, leaving him equal parts worried and confused. I'm sorry, she mumbled piteously. I'll admit you can be weird sometimes, he laughed, causing her flinch visibly. He continued quickly, reaching down and retaking her hand without looking. But you don't have anything to apologize for, honest. I appreciate you. I mean, I appreciate your friendship. They walked in that awkward silence for a time, both looking anywhere but at one another and blushing deeply. Before too long Naruto's bashful grin had returned, and he squeezed Hinata's hand again. She squeezed back. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Are you sure, Sasuke? Naruto asked. Yeah, I can do it. Sasuke seemed annoyed at being asked the same question so many times, but he understood his friend's apprehension. I'll think of something before midnight, trust me. Naruto nodded. They were sitting on the floor in Aruka's living room, legs crossed and facing one another. Three glasses of water sat close at hand, along with an empty pitcher. Hours had passed, and it was now half past five. They had discussed at length possibilities and plans of action to help Haku and although each of them knew that their decided course was a feeble one, they had little choice. Violence wouldn't do, and neither would attempting a covert operation. Their best option was, unfortunately, diplomacy. All right, Naruto sighed, switching from his serious expression to a grin. Let's head to dinner. No reason to miss out on celebration barbecue. Sasuke opened his mouth to remind Naruto that he hadn't planned to go, but he was cut off by his friend's raised hand. Come on, Sasuke, we already know the plan. Granted, the plan sucks, but it's all we've got. Sitting around getting worked up over it won't help Haku. Again Sasuke seemed like he wanted to protest, but this time stopped on his own accord and nodded. And when we get Haku out, we'll take him to dinner there too. They couldn't help sharing a smile at that. A few minutes later Sasuke and Naruto were waiting in the living room again, changed and ready to go. It wasn't a particularly fancy restaurant, but it was a good excuse to get out of their normal uniforms. Naruto tugged at his collar self-consciously. He had chosen to wear a relatively close-fitting, dark blue coat that folded in on both sides. The two folds overlapped, allowing the top layer to cut diagonally from sternum to hip, and it was tied off with a black cord just below his waist. The formal long sleeve covered a simple black t-shirt, only the collar of which could be seen. A pair of black slacks completed his attire. Sasuke had gone with a much more traditional approach. The emblem of the Uchiha clan stood out boldly against the black silk on the back of his yukata, complemented by a crimson sash tied about his waist. He had even gone so far as to don wooden sandals. The folds of his robe were left slightly open at the top, enough to show just below his collar bones. 
Naruto had been sure to snicker and point out how silly that particular element was, but Sasuke had merely shrugged and insisted that it was comfortable. When Hinata came out of her room, that is, Naruto's old bedroom, the boy's reactions were delayed, but similar. That is, as similar as two opposites could be. Naruto's jaw nearly hit the ground, and Sasuke blinked twice. She had allowed her hair to start growing out since moving in with Aruka and Naruto, and it was now pulled up into a graceful bun held in place by two ornate silver chopsticks. Her kimono matched the dark theme worn by her friends, its smooth black fabric was inlaid with elegantly swirling patterns of silver, several of which ended in violet rose blossoms. Her sandaled feet shuffled on the floor as she tugged at one of the bangs framing her flushing face, glancing up and burning a darker red upon seeing their reactions. W what? She asked as defensively as she could manage. It ended up sounding quiet and meek, as usual. You look great. Naruto chirped, grinning broadly and rubbing at the back of his head. Wow. Sasuke muttered, smirking and shaking his head. You ought to dress up more often, Hanada. It took every bit of self-control she had not to flee back into the bedroom. Instead she tried to force the blush from her features and ducked her head, mumbling something that might have been an apology, or perhaps a mention of thanks. Naruto and Sasuke glanced at each other and shrugged. Ten minutes later they arrived at the restaurant. A few heads turned to the trio as they entered, and more than one eyebrow rose in their wake. Aruka was sitting at a corner booth, still in his chunin garb and forehead protector. His eyes went wide as he saw them, but the surprise didn't stop his smile and soft whistle. Hey you three, what's the occasion? He laughed, ushering them into their seats. Naruto and Hinata sat opposite Aruka and Sasuke, everyone falling in automatically as if it had been planned. Aruka blinked and shrugged to himself before settling back down. I mean, not that I mind seeing you all dressed up but you could have told me so I'd be a little more prepared. His tone was light and playful, it was apparent that he wasn't overly concerned, just curious. It's for later, Naruto admitted, glancing from Sasuke to Hinata. They both gave him a small nod. Aruka looked between all three, quirking an eyebrow. Let's order first, and I'll tell you. There's a lot to talk about. It was just before seven by the time they had finished their meal, enjoying a temporary lapse in conversation to sit silently with their tea. After a time Aruka set his cup down, looking pointedly at Naruto. All right, so what's up? I'm enjoying the meal and hearing about your missions and training, but I'd like to know what's going on after this for you three. Naruto swirled the liquid in his cup, thinking for a long moment before taking another sip and exhaling deeply. Aruka sensei do you remember the boy that came back with us from Wave Country? Aruka blinked and nodded. Haku, right. Naruto returned his nod. Well. Dot quote. It took half an hour to tell the whole story, and Naruto kept his voice low despite their relatively empty section. He had filled Aruka in on bits and pieces of the mission, certainly none of the heavier parts. Now he took turns with his friends, explaining how they had met Haku and who he was, what he had done, and what they were going to try to do that evening. Aruka listened with rapt attention, taking in every detail and allowing the various emotions brought on by the retelling to play across his features. He had read Kakashi's mission report, of course, but it hadn't included the genin's viewpoints so vividly. We owe him for sparing Sasuke and Hinata, Naruto concluded, looking back into his now cold tea. And I owe him, for killing Zabuza. Aruka gave him a sharp look and began to speak, but his former student cut him off quickly. I know it was the right thing to do, Aruka sensei. At least, I think it was. But, the Chunin glanced to each of Naruto's friends. Both of them were looking at Naruto. Sasuke looked impassive, though determined. Hanada's expression was overflowing with empathy, but it was evident that they had discussed this at length else she would look more worried. Whether or not it was the right thing to do doesn't matter. He lost his only friend, Aruka sensei Even if I was right in doing it, he's alone now because of me, and they want to just kill him. He's not a bad person, and we think we can help him. And the clothes? He asked with a worried, wry smile. Naruto grinned at him, looking a little embarrassed. It was Hinata's idea. She said we have a better chance of being taken seriously if we present ourselves well, or something. Hanada flushed and stared intently at her lap. Aruka beamed at her and shook his head, 
smiling genuinely now. All right, I understand. I hope you three succeed tonight, but just be careful okay? They all nodded, and he leaned back with a sigh. Now, what else did you want to talk about? Naruto blinked at him, and the other two turned to do the same. Something's been nagging at you. Not just you, Naruto, but all three of you, since you got back from that mission. Was Haku the only thing on your minds? Uruka didn't miss a thing, it seemed. Naruto gave him a small smile, and his eyes looked tired as they warily scanned the restaurant. It wasn't nearly as full as when they had first arrived, and there was nobody left nearby to overhear their conversation. Uruka tensed slightly. What could be a weightier topic than what they had just discussed? I found out about the Kayubi, Uruka sensei, Naruto said quietly, examining his hands. Uruka's breath caught in his throat, and he suddenly felt sick. The boy glanced up at him and grinned feebly. Mizuki told me about it years ago, in the forest when he attacked me. It didn't make a lot of sense at the time, but since then, and especially on that mission, I realized that it was true. Uruka's gaze was distant, but he remembered himself to look quickly between Sasuke and Hinata, neither of them looked surprised. Naruto shook his head. They found out in Wave Country. It took Naruto another long while to explain what had happened on the mission. He skipped over the conversations with the fox demon, instead focusing on the physical events and his conversation with Kakashi afterwards. By the time he had finished it was close to eight and they were one of the last parties left in the establishment. As the story came to an end Uruka sagged back in his seat, head resting against the wall as his eyes closed. It was a long moment before he opened his eyes again. I'm sorry I couldn't tell you, Naruto, he said finally, voice a little tight. The current Hokage, Serutobi-sama, passed a law after the Yandaimi sealed away the Kayubi. Nobody was allowed to tell you of it, under penalty of death. Naruto simply nodded dully, it appeared he had worked that much out. It was meant to protect you, Naruto. There are those that would kill you, or worse, if they found out that you were a Jinchuriki. Jinchuriki, Hanada asked tentatively, looking from Uruka to Naruto. It's what a person holding a tailed beast is called. I guess that's not exactly a secret. There are more. Naruto asked incredulously, eyes growing wide as he regarded Uruka. His old teacher nodded gravely, leaning his forearms on the table as he continued. We're not sure about the details, really, any village that might have a Jinchuriki keeps it as a closely guarded secret, for similar reasons we've kept it from you. Naruto nodded slowly and he appeared to be calm, but his white knuckles on the table gave him away. Rumors, or legends, I guess is more appropriate say there are nine-tailed beasts in the world, somewhere. They could be running wild, or they could be sealed inside a person like the Kayubi was. Nobody knows for sure. Eight more, Naruto breathed, falling back against the booth, stunned. Everybody else at the table was surprised, though, when a fierce grin appeared on the boy's face. I'm not the only one. I'm not alone with this after all. He felt guilty immediately after thinking it, glancing at his friends with an apologetic look that they didn't understand. At least, not the only Jinchuriki. Maybe I'll get to meet them one day, he said faintly with a small laugh. Maybe, Uruka said smiling, the gesture not without a hint of sadness. He could tell that the news had brought a measure of comfort to Naruto. Even if the small fact couldn't assuage a fraction of the burden he carried, it was something. After a long and semi-comfortable silence, Uruka coughed and shifted over to rise from the table. It's getting late. They're going to be closing soon. The other three nodded without saying anything, following his lead and standing. Naruto left payment for the meal on the edge of the table before they departed, eliciting a small, proud smile from Uruka. I'll be waiting for you back home. Uruka had turned to address them outside of the restaurant, looking seriously at each of them in turn. Good luck, and be safe. They nodded dutifully and turned, disappearing into the gathering night. Uruka stood there for a while, staring after them with a faraway look in his eyes. They shouldn't have to grow up so fast, he murmured to himself as he finally turned, hands finding his pockets as he began to walk home. But they do in this world. There's no other way to survive. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Three silent figures moved through the streets of Konoha, 
all but invisible in the moonless night. Naruto, Sasuke, and Hinata had waited in the park until the time had come, going over last-minute planning. In truth there was little planning to be done outside of getting in and deciding what they were going to say and do when they got there. It was half past eleven as they reached the Hokage's building, the towering structure seemed much more daunting now than it did during the day. As Kakashi had promised, the front door was unlocked, and they hurried in and down the indicated staircase immediately. Naruto had suggested a dramatic entrance right before midnight, but both Sasuke and Hinata had pointed out that it was possible that the execution could happen sooner than planned. It would be safer to go in at least 20 minutes before, else they risked being too late. They reached the basement and continued on silent feet, stopping at the last door on the left after the required right turn. By a Kugan, Hinata whispered. She stared intently at the door for a moment, glancing from side to side before nodding. It looks like Haku's inside, on his knees in the center of the room. There are maybe twenty others in a circle around him. Kakashi sensei's there, too. Sasuke and Naruto both nodded, then braced themselves. Hanada nodded back, raised her hand slowly, and knocked on the door. It wasn't the most dramatic announcement, but it sounded like it caused a minor commotion on the other side of the door. The sound of shuffling feet met their ears before the door cracked open, revealing a sliver of Kakashi's face visible on the other side. His eye scrunched up like it always did when he was smiling, and he closed the door again. Some hurried mutters could be heard just on the other side of the entrance, and then there was silence for a long moment. The door opened a few seconds later, wide enough to allow them to enter but blocked by a surly-looking ninja wearing a bandana under his Hitai 8. This area is off-limits. You are to leave at once. Before he could shut the door on them, Hanada spoke up, her voice uncharacteristically clear and firm. We have come to speak on behalf of the prisoner Haku. No matter the crimes of which he is accused, he is entitled to receive word on his behalf before his sentence is to be carried out. We humbly request permission to enter and speak. The man froze, eyes narrowing at the girl and her companions. Hanada began to tremble slightly, but she stood her ground. Ah, she is quite right, an amused, pleasant voice said from the other side of the door. Please let them through, Genma. After a glance over his shoulder the doorman shrugged, stepping back to allow them through. Hanada swallowed and started forward, Naruto and Sasuke stepping in right behind her. The room was small and swathed in darkness along all sides. A single light hung from the stone ceiling, bathing the center in a circle of pale illumination. The strange setup made it difficult to see the faces of those standing just outside of the light, though a few profiles were familiar. The Hokage was given away by his hat, of course, and Kakashi's hair was hard to mistake. The rest were unrecognizable shadows, looming all around them and shifting in the darkness. Haku was at the center of the room, his hands bound behind him. He had been forced to kneel there, blindfolded and in the same clothes he had been wearing when he had arrived in Konoha. His garments looked ragged and like they hadn't been washed. Despite his condition the boy was still, and what could be seen of his face was completely placid. Haku didn't appear even mildly troubled by the circumstances. Hayuga Hanada, the Hokage's voice sounded again, still touched with a tone of amusement. Uchiha Sasuke, Uzumaki Naruto. As he stated each of their names they bowed, taking their place in the light just in front of Haku. What is it that you wish to say? Pardon me, Hokage-sama. The voice belonged to one of the shadows at the old man's side. His face was shrouded like the others, but his head seemed to be slightly compressed as if by bandages, and one of his arms was held up towards his chest like it might be injured and placed in a sling. Ibiki's interrogation of the boy revealed that he had been working closely with Zabuza for many years. He attempted to kill four shinobi and a client of the leaf. We know also that he has aided in the murder of many more outside of our own village. All of this he has done of his own free will, and by a majority decision his sentence was given. I am aware, Danzo, the Sandame said with a sigh. But no life should be taken lightly. Death is final. He let the words sink in for a few seconds before continuing. We would be doing our youth a disservice by spurning their pleas, and only prove that our village is not a just one. Danzo seemed to tense for a moment, then sighed and stepped back. Please proceed, Team 7. What are you doing? 
Haku whispered, sounding distant but calm. Trying to help, Naruto responded quietly, nodding to Hinata. Shushin let us. Haku raised his head slightly, mouth working as though he couldn't have found words even if he had wanted to. Hinata stepped forward then, only a pace in front of her friends, and spoke. We have come to request clemency for Haku, and offer our own testimony in hopes that you might reconsider his sentence. Behind her, Haku's lips parted in what could only be disbelief. To begin, I'd like to tell of my own experiences. I encountered Haku once before our battle at Bridge 7. At the time I was alone, and I believe he could have easily killed me had he wished to. A few murmurs from around the room started up and died away quickly as she continued, hands held tightly together in front of her. From that instance I was able to understand a little about Haku, mainly that he is not an innately violent or cruel person. His motivation to live was in Momochi Zabuza, who had taken him in at a young and impressionable age. I believe that, despite Zabaza's ways, he did care for Haku. Because of the bond they shared, and the circumstances of his upbringing, I believe that he should be offered leniency on account of his actions. He is a kind person, Hokage-sama. I think even kind people can be used by those with ill intentions. She looked around, pausing for effect like they had practiced. If this sentence is carried out without granting him the chance to prove himself a friend of Konoha, as I believe he can be, it would be travesty. Hanada bowed and stepped back, shaking visibly. Naruto stepped forward as his friend returned to stand in front of Haku. As they passed one another he purposefully stepped too close, finding her hand and grasping it tightly for a fraction of a second. He flashed an encouraging smile at her as he passed, and then he stood in front on his own. He couldn't see it, but Hinata had stopped trembling and stood facing the Hokage, silently thanking Naruto for giving her strength again to stand fast. Hokage-sama, I think I can explain Haku's actions from a more personal perspective. That got people muttering again, though as before they quieted as Naruto continued. As Hinata-chan said, he continued, not seeing her flush behind him. Haku and Zabuza cared about each other, even if it was in a strange way. But when I was about to kill Haku at the bridge, Zabuza got in my way, and sacrificed himself to save his friend. Kakashi-sensei told me that, in Zabuza's last seconds alive, he wanted us to know that Haku was a kind person, and not to be blamed for his actions against us. Against his own will Naruto's voice grew more impassioned as he went on, though he consciously kept it respectfully low. I know what it's like to have nothing, to have no one. If I'd been given the same opportunity as Haku when I was younger, do you think I would have passed up on the chance to be with somebody who wanted me? Silence. Not even the rustle of clothing could be heard, and his breathing suddenly felt loud in his own ears. I turned out okay because somebody cared enough to take me in, to show me what it means to be human. Haku didn't have that chance. Zabuza may have ended up caring for him in the end but he only wanted Haku as a tool to help accomplish his own goals. But the thing is, he wanted Haku, and that was more than anybody else had given him. Please, don't make the mistake of assuming he's a bad person just because of the man he worked for. Haku was led astray, but I know that he can be an ally if we give him the chance. By now he had gotten control of his voice again, and he ended on a sincere note. With a bow he stepped back, fists clenched as his sides. Sasuke looked around before he moved, a graceful step that barely disturbed his garments. For a long moment he simply examined the gathered audience, seeming to see more than his friends had. A few that his eyes traveled over shifted uncomfortably. When his gaze finally settled on the Hokage, the old man noted that his Sharingan had been activated. The boy's eyes were hard, filled with confidence, defiance, and smoldering anger. Sandame sama he began calmly. I don't believe that I have personal experience to offer in Haku's defense, or even private encounters to judge his personality by. However, what I do have is logic and reason, both of which tell me that his life should be spared. Sasuke paused there, taking a moment to sweep his gaze around the room again. You all read Kakashi's report, yes. I'm sure that in it were our accounts of what happened inside of Haku's mirror technique. In case you have forgotten, Haku allowed Hinata and I to live. That incited a few more mutters in the room, and even a stray snort. Had it been any other ninja, 
Had Zabuza chosen to recruit a bloodthirsty killer, we would be dead right now. Sasuke stopped again, sweeping back to the Hokage. Does that sound like a murderer to you, Hokage-sama? Does it sound like somebody who deserves to be sentenced to death, somebody who spared two defenseless genin? I think, though, that we've covered just how we feel about Haku as a person. But have you yet considered him as an asset? The Hokage smiled from the shadows, nodding slightly for the boy to continue. The three of us together were barely able to bring him down, and he possesses a rare bloodline trait as well. He's at least of Chunin level right now. Don't you think that a reportedly kind, skilled ninja in possession of a potent Keke Jenke could be invaluable to the village? We have already considered this. It is, Danzo began, but Sasuke cut him off sharply. Well consider it harder. It wasn't loud, he barely spoke above a normal conversational volume. However, the ironclad ferocity could be felt by every individual present, and it stopped the other man in his tracks. You seem so willing to ignore what we say, to throw reason to the wayside. What do we have to do say to convince you to spare his life? What needs to be done to give him the chance he deserves? Complete silence filled the room again, broken this time only by the soft tapping of tears hitting the ground. Haku was participating in the quiet, stunned but still kneeling, his face fully turned up towards them now. As far as anyone might be able to tell, his expression was still blank, but the cloth covering the lower part of his eyes was darker than the rest. Trails of tears led down to drip from his chin, freezing halfway down to clink lightly on the hard floor. He didn't understand why they were going out on a limb for him after all he had done. Zabuza was dead, he no longer had a reason to live. He was ready to die. Why did they have to care so much? Kakashi took his cue at Sasuke's final appeal, stepping from the shadows to stand just behind his students. Hokage-sama, he intoned, inclining his head politely. I had a chance to speak to Haku for several days before we returned to Konoha. I agree with my students, and I trust their opinions in this matter. I know that a pardon is out of the question, but I would request that he be released on strict probation under my supervision. I will take full responsibility for his actions until such a time that he can be accepted as a full shinobi, and an ally of the leaf. It was like the other bits of reticence throughout their speeches had been a practice run. Silence hung heavy in the room, marred only by the soft buzz of the light above. Seconds turned into years in that oppressive quiet, and by the time the Hokage spoke more than one bead of sweat had formed on more than one brow. Kakashi. He began in the same calm voice, eyes sparkling in the dimness. Hanada was biting her lip harder than normal, and Naruto and Sasuke held their breath. I find your students' reasoning compelling enough to grant your request for probation. However, they caught their breath again at the exhale, hanging on the Hokage's every word. You must understand that the boy is your responsibility. If he harms any citizen of the hidden leaf, or breaks any of our laws, you will stand with him in his sentencing. Do you understand? Yes, Hokage-sama, Kakashi said without hesitating, bowing again. I understand and accept the responsibility. You can't, another voice began again, but was cut off once more. I can, Homura, the Sandame said firmly, his voice taking on the edge of authority. As Hokage I am permitted to alter a sentence as I see fit. You know as well as any that I do not abuse this power. I am choosing to put my trust in Kakashi and his team, and in Haku. I agree with the Hirazan's decision. This voice was female, though weathered with age. She had also addressed the Sandame by his first name. The child may prove useful in the future. Slowly, a murmur of assent rippled through the room. If the Hokage and even one of his advisors saw promise where others did not, it was worth the chance. Thank you, Hokage-sama. You detained Sama. Kakashi bowed again, then turned to the genin. Wait for me outside. Haku and I will be out soon. They nodded, and all glanced once back at Haku before hurriedly complying. Even Hanada had to resist the urge to sprint from the small room in a mixture of sheer adrenaline, fear, and elation. It was as unbelievable but they had done it. Haku was safe. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. Naruto leaned against the wall outside. His dress shirt had been unfolded and now hung all around him, held up only by the makeshift belt. The black undershirt clung to him, 
what skin showed on his arms and neck glistening with sweat. The warm summer air did little to help him cool down, but the heat was far from his mind at the moment. Yeah, he whooped again into the night. Sasuke and Hinata both smiled at him wearily, though it was clear they were more relieved than excited as he was. Sasuke had pulled his yukata back so that most of his lean torso and shoulders were exposed, similarly covered in perspiration. Poor Hinata didn't have the option to modestly cool off like her friends, but she had loosened her kimono slightly to at least get some air flow going. It had been a stressful night. They stood quietly together for nearly 20 minutes, the air seeming to cool as they began to calm down. By the time the doors to the tower opened they felt completely normal again though they tensed as Kakashi appeared a second later. Haku followed just behind him wearing a lost expression. Great job you three, Kakashi said approvingly, nodding. Naruto beamed. Hanada pressed her index fingers together and ducked her head, though she looked pleased and relieved. Sasuke, though, just smirked at him. You knew that the Hokage had the final say, he said, shaking his head. That's why you wanted us to come. If we all came and defended Haku in front of everybody, it gave him the perfect excuse to grant Haku's probation. Kakashi didn't respond to that, but he winked mischievously. Those were some pretty eloquent speeches, especially yours Hinata. How long did it take you to get the words right? Three or four hours, Hinata said timidly, blushing lightly at the attention. I learned how to speak properly at my home, and my tutor had me memorize words often used at formal occasions. So that's how these two managed to sound halfway decent, Kakashi mused, nodding slowly to emphasize the jest. Sasuke gave him a level look, though couldn't stop the smirk from creeping into his expression. You bet, Naruto stated proudly, nudging Hinata's shoulder with his. Without Hinata we would have been tripping all over ourselves in there. It was then that he took notice of Haku again, who had been staring at them in turn, face completely blank. Oh yeah, hey Haku. Glad you made it out okay. He gave the other boy his best grin. Why? Haku asked hollowly, empty eyes trying to work out the mystery in front of him. Why what? Naruto asked, raising an eyebrow and letting his smile fade to a small quirk. Why did you save my life? You heard what we said. I mean, some of the stuff we may have exaggerated or played up a little, but we still think you're a nice person. Besides, you didn't kill Hinata or Sasuke. We can just call it even now. Naruto's smile returned as he laced his fingers behind his head. It wasn't much, but Haku's expression twitched, and fresh tears began to well and fall. Here were three strangers, people whose lives he had threatened, and they had fought for his life. They had defended him, and what's more they believed in him. He was wanted somewhere, and even if it was too much for him to puzzle out, it felt real. I, he started, his voice thick. Everything felt heavy all of a sudden, and the world was spinning. Kakashi caught the boy before he fell. He blinked, then looked up at the other three. I think he fainted. Kakashi sounded relatively amused as he leaned down and lifted the unconscious boy carefully. Well, I hadn't thought too much about this possibility, but he's going to need somewhere to stay. I could keep him with me, but I think it would be better if we got him a place to stay near one of you. They all looked at him curiously at that, and he shrugged. You three fought for him, and I know he'll appreciate that. It'll go a long way towards rehabilitation if he can be near people who might one day be his friends. As long as I can check up on him regularly, it doesn't matter where he stays. He can stay with me. They all turned to look at Sasuke, who glanced at each of them and shrugged. My place is big enough for two people, and I have a spare bedroll at least. He can stay there until he's ready to find his own apartment. Kakashi nodded after a few seconds, though spoke as soon as he began walking next to Sasuke. I know you all have faith in him, and I truly believe he's a good person as well. But be careful, especially if you're going to have him living with you. Sasuke nodded as they walked, he had already thought it over. All right then, I'll bring him over. Naruto, Hanada, he called back, thank you again. Get some sleep. I still expect you at 9 tomorrow for missions. Only if you're there on time, Sensei, Naruto chuckled. He turned and winked at Hinata and started off towards Aruka's, wondering why she was blushing again. Without either of them fully realizing it, 
They walked back home, hand in hand. That's it for this part if you enjoyed it then like, share and subscribe for the next video as it's going to be more interesting and also check out my other playlists hope you would like them too.